Hello, everyone, and welcome to Techno Crime Fighters Forum number 30. Um, we are here this morning with um, a rather thinned out panel. However, I'm hoping that we'll still have fabulous information. Oh, dear. Okay, hold on one second. That was me speaking on the other page. So I've paused that. Anyway, so I'm here with Karen Stewart. And uh, we're going to start off the conversation. Good morning. With... Hi, Karen. Glad to see you. <laughs> Glad we're both here together. <laughs> and we'll start off the conversation this morning um, with a few very important subjects. And then hopefully Millicent will join us later. And after that, perhaps Chris Burton. And some of you may be familiar with my podcast with Chris Burton. Lately, we've been really um, talking about the Voice to Skull program as he experiences it and the whole Living Manchurian Candidate program that he's really blowing the lid off of. So very important conversations with him. I'm still working on getting his interview out. I had intended to post the interview yesterday. And of course, you know, I was uh, hit with major PC issues, freezing all the time, um, inability to transfer my entire document from my Word file to WordPress, graphics disappearing as I did it, font, fonts changing, everything, you know, falling apart. So I'm uh, forced to sit and do it all over again. And all of that, as you know, takes a little bit of time if anybody has done any web design work at all. So you know, so unfortunately, the the interview has not been posted yet. But I'm hoping that if, if Chris comes on today, and you know, you have the podcast in front of you to refer to, um, and hopefully that will serve as some kind of appetizer for the interview, which is blockbuster, I can assure you, it's it's pretty long, it's compendious, it's comprehensive. And the reason I think it's um, so powerful is because Chris is a brilliant writer, and he really took some great pains to sit down and answer those questions. Um, you know, this was an email interview back and forth to answer those questions very thoughtfully and reflectively and um, deeply, profoundly. So um, hopefully it will be ready to post within the next couple of days, within today and tomorrow, I will be able to post it on my site. So something to look forward to, I hope. So Karen, you had something very um, important to share this morning. You have two documents, I think, that um, I think would be very useful to talk about. And the first, well, I'll let you describe it. If you can tell us, give us a little background on what the document is and what the purpose is and uh, what kind of information really um, you wish to convey to the entire American populace with this document. Okay, well, in the last week or two, a couple of documents just kind of begged to be written. Uh, one of them was, um, what is the lie or the lie? And so I just sat down and I know that everybody who's been falsely and illegally targeted racks their brain to think, what is the lie? that these people are being told that has turned them into absolute maniacs. And I think every one of us looks back at our lives and we think, you know what? <laughs> I'm not a bad person. I don't, I'm not a criminal. You know, I've never been, you know, uh, now for me, I did, I did get arrested last year and that's another topic <laughs> because someone attacked me and I dared to defend myself. So that's a different topic. That's a setup. That is not a history of doing anything wrong. So up until a perpetrator physically attacked me on my family's property by jumping out of hiding and attacking me, I had had zero as far as, you know, like a criminal record. As you can imagine, you can't really balance a criminal record with working uh, in the intelligence community or you shouldn't. <laughs> you, know, you shouldn't be able to, mm -hmm. which I would say was true until the last decade or so. But um, the document that basically begged to be written was what is the lie where I examine, you know, what is the lie that basically turns your neighbors against you when you've lived there for how many years and never done anything but say hello to them or maybe feed their cat when they were gone or you've shown nothing but kindness and all of a sudden they think that you're Satan. So what is the lie? And then I say, what is the lie? And I go through um, a lot of different scenarios. What is the lie that makes people do this? What is the lie that makes people do that? And I'm hoping if people like it, and some have written and said, you know, I'd like a copy of that, and I send it out very gladly, um, 
that that will make somebody who's capable of thinking think you know now not all these nitwits are capable they want those big screen tvs they want those high heel shoes that say gucci they don't care as long as uh, the government says you know you're there's open season on you they could care less about right and wrong so those people it's not going to it's not going to affect but you know for anybody who wants a copy of that um do please email me at k a m s 56 at me.com i will send you a copy and then you can use it on whoever you think might actually read it and uh, be capable of critically thinking now the second thing excuse me uh-huh. the second thing i looked at uh, the lie and it's about four pages so i said well that's not very concise so i said well you know people are always looking for flyers and i got something down to about two pages and that is the, it's called the DHS, Department of Homeland Security Scam and Human Trafficking of Innocent Citizens. And so I just basically go through um, as much as possible trying to condense what is the cause of what is happening to us and what exactly is happening to us. Now, people, I may not have gotten to everything that's happening to you. I apologize. I was going for a two page uh, paper. And if you pass this out and people start to be interested, you can tell them uh, the differences between what I'm saying happens and maybe some of the more exotic things that are happening to you. So it's a tool. And again, if you want a copy of it, um, do please email me and I will send you the, um, the Word doc. And then you can print it out yourself and uh, use it how you wish to. Brilliant. So Karen, do you want to read out a little bit from both of these documents? I mean, first from what is the lie? You know, I think you had some really powerful uh, sections in there. You posted okay. it on Facebook a little while ago, right? I did. I did. Um, I'll have to run, get my iPad because I don't have a paper copy of it. So if you give me a second, I'll be right back. Oh, no problem. Yes. So I know there's a lot of um, interesting comments and in chat at this point about this document. And I think some people have seen it. So... Um, I'm thrilled about that because uh, people are connected on Facebook and they've seen the document. Sorry, sorry to keep you waiting. Let's see if I can find this. But, you know, I mean, we need to share flyers with each other. I mean, you guys write yeah. one and share it with me and I'll share what occurs to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you, can, you can show five different flyers to the neighbor next door and maybe only one of them makes the impact that you need. So, hey, let's try, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, let me find And let's this. talk a little bit about flyer campaigns, actually, um, you know, after you read, because um, I, I'm very interested in uh, how people can begin to start making an impact on the ground, um, you know, and there's lots of things we can say about that shortly. Okay. Well, I have got the lie up here, and yes, that sucker's four pages. So <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. I, I just couldn't uh, write any shorter in, on this topic. Um, okay, I start out saying thousands upon thousands of quote-unquote targeted individuals, better described as falsely accused innocent people, are being illegally used, in parentheses, human trafficked, um, as techno-chum to feed the growing voracious Orwellian police state. Through legalistic sleight of hand by Homeland Security, this ruse is really to not only bloat the number of perceived terrorists on the watch list to validate the hypergrowth of unnecessary security overlords, but also to provide unwilling, non-consensual human test subjects for draconian electronic or kinetic weaponry manufacturers to use on them as well as subjects for unwelcome, covert, invasive technologies forced upon them secretly by complicit medical and high-tech companies that maim, torture, kill, to gather data for presumably their stockholders or clients as to the efficacy of these Franken technologies. And then then the rest of the paragraph is, these techno-terrorists consider citizens' property, damaged or diseased citizens as gold mines, meaning from the insurance company perspective, um, and healthy citizens are worthless unless appropriated for use as guinea pigs. 
the victims who have been blindsided by this emergent godless capitalism and godless science predation in what will be known as the 21st century dark ages inevitably ponder what the lie could possibly be that is being told to induce neighbors, colleagues, service people, post office workers, utility workers, clergy, law enforcement, nurses, doctors, dentists, military, EMTs, family members at Al to knowingly conspire to purposely do them grievous harm even unto death. And so for the rest of the, you know, three and a half more pages, then it, it goes on rather like that. And I'm saying basically, what is the lie that makes this person do this? What is the lie that makes that person do that? And so it's just an examination of what in the world could possibly be the lie that makes all of these people lose their humanity and their decency and totally forget the fact that maybe they've lived across the street from you or known you five years in church and never seen you do anything terrible. So why are you now this monster with no proof just because some jerk came to their house, maybe waved a badge and said, oh, he's really a Martian. Mm -hmm. And I think well, unfortunately it's the power of that badge, you know, the, the bogus power of that badge. You know, watch the badge. <laughs> you know, listen to what I have to say. It's the unicorns. Yes. You know. And it's the FBI. It's the CIA. It's the who else? It's the DHS. It's Homeland Security. This person is a target. This person is a potential terrorist, a potential extremist. He or she does not have a criminal record as yet, but we are investigating. There is a criminal investigation that's been opened on this person, the school teacher across the street, that person who looks like she wouldn't harm a fly. Yes, that's how the, that's how they present to you. They look like they wouldn't harm a fly, but you never know. This look, let, and you know that's the other thing. I think they show them files as well from various people. I've gotten reports that um, they are being shown something. They, they're literally being shown something. You know, they're being shown a document or a whole file with falsified information on it. Right. I, you know, I'm sorry, but what is it they could be showing? A coloring book? <laughs> you know, I mean, if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. And they have to be totally fabricating lies to put, oh, here's a document. We're not going to let you read it. Yes, yeah, something like else. that. Yes. And you also, know. I think it's um, it could be sort of a cut and paste uh, thing of, you know, browsing history on the internet, perhaps, or some or email that somebody might have sent taken completely out of context, something like that, a conversation recorded taken out of context, you know, or it's the very same document for 300,000 people, Yeah, that you know, be. that is never scrutinized. And yes. they make up this vague uh, document that has accusations like we suspect she was jaywalking for years before her neighbor caught her you know mm -hmm. you know it's just it's ludicrous i mean how is it all of these people have totally lost their critical thinking skills how is they, it they have lost their critical thinking skills they've lost their humanity they've lost their compassion and their awareness they've lost their enabliness you know, how is it that they are so willing to throw the neighbor under the bus and simply fall over when the badge approaches them, you know? And if you remember, I recently published Sherry's story. And, um, you know, Sherry, um, well, it's a long and involved story. Basically, she faced a lot of uh, retaliation after speaking out of, as an Alzheimer's advocate uh, when her grandmother was being treated very poorly in uh, various nursing home facilities in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And after that, she started to experience all sorts of harassment on the streets, you know, literally the basic gang stalking, COINTELPRO regimen, stalking, harassment, and so forth and so on. And then when she later moved to New Mexico, she was visited there by the Secret Service. And, you know, that's connected to her letter to Obama. She wrote a very nice letter to President Obama, which is printed along with her interview in my, um, in my article on my website. And uh, basically, she kind of implored him. She appealed to his finer side, um, if one exists. 
to to kindly <laughs> to kindly um, pay attention to the Alzheimer's issue, you know, and that it was a wonderful letter, very warmly written, very um, wholeheartedly written, poetically written. She enclosed a poem of hers for her grandmother in it, and so on and so forth. And um, and later on, you know, she was hit with synthetic telepathy. She was hit with uh, military grade um, voice to skull technology. And um, the, so her su subsequent letters to President Obama, because, you know, Sherry is a brilliant woman who knows exactly at whose door uh, to lay the blame. And she knocked on the president's door and she sent letters via the White House website saying, please stop doing this. You know, do you, do you think you have any right? How would you like to be hit with vo a voice to skull technology? It's pretty abrasive. It's pretty abusive. It's very wrong. And nobody should be subjected to this. Well, shortly after that, uh, the Secret Service paid her neighbors a visit. And one of her neighbors actually told her what transpired. And this neighbor, and we have to say, you know, exactly, there are very few people in America, apparently, who are standing up for those who are being wrongfully targeted. But this neighbor was fantastic, if you remember that whole story. Mm -hmm. um, so just briefly to, to recap, you know, the, the Secret Service guy went and asked her, so have you seen her toting a gun case back and forth? to and from work and the neighbor looked at him blankly and said you mean her yoga mat and her yoga case, <laughs> yoga mat case. <laughs> because sherry is an ardent yogi and does bikram yoga you know and this is a person who was a dancer and choreographer and works as an accounting manager. And to sell his sh Sherry's reputation seems absolutely laughable to me. So, and, and apparently also to this neighbor who stood up for her. And then the guy said, so, and did you see, um, have you seen her carrying strange bags filled with strange stuff back and forth into her house? And <laughs> the neighbor laughed and said, those are her grocery bags, the recycled <laughs> bags. She goes to the grocery store and picks up groceries and puts them in the recycled bags. So, I mean, this is the extent of the idiocy that we are being faced with today. We have these goons from the Secret Service knocking on people's doors and trying to destroy people's reputations. And in your case, as you said, Karen, last time, I mean, that was a brilliant story you told us about the FBI doing the exact same thing, right? Yeah. You just have to wonder, dear God, you know, are these people really that stupid or are they just that feeble a liar, you know, to say, you know, she's carrying a gun case and somebody with three digits in their IQ actually says, that's a yoga mat, <laughs> you know? Yes. You know, maybe you ought to get some training. <laughs> very, very shocking because what it suggests is they're trying desperately to frame people. They're trying desperately, you know? And, um, and that's what they're doing in our neighborhoods. I wonder what the, well, I do know one of the stories that's been relayed because I heard one of my neighbor's guests at a pool party that they had um, say it out loud, looking across at me into my yard, looking at me and uh, say, I suppose this is what they call a loud whisper or a stage aside. Um, mm -hmm. They say she's a night walker. So, <laughs> I was rather amazed to hear this information and I looked across at this very young woman and you know I saw a whole group of young faces looking earnestly at me to uh, to determine you know the general makeup of the night walker the local neighborhood night walker well lately I have become a night walker I should say I've started to take the dog out at night and I do walk about well, I was going to say that I must be one, too, because very often I take my two dogs out <laughs> after night, you know, after dark. She's a night walker with two dogs. <laughs> yes. Night walker with dog. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it blows my mind that this is the kind of story that's going around. You know, go back and look at my resume. Take a look at, you know, what I've been doing for the last 20 years of my life, you know. Before you go around imagining I'm a night walker, for God's sake. I don't have time for any of that nonsense. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's possible for us to laugh it off because it is so far removed from who we are. But in actuality, it is actually destructive of reputations. It's destructive mm -hmm. of your life in the neighborhood because people treat you like dirt. People are extremely hostile to you. 
And, uh, you know, it's destructive of your business and career reputation as well, because you lose, and this is what blacklisting is all about. People lose their contacts, they lose their businesses, they lose their clients. So, you know, it's not really funny. So it's, and this is what they're yeah. doing. This is the total takedown that these secret agencies and secret services, services are doing doing which really brings up that other issue of what i wanted to talk about today is domestic terrorism you know which is of course as we know with the las vegas shooting a very very current topic so uh, we're living in the age of domestic terrorism that is manufactured manufactured domestic terrorism courtesy homeland security courtesy the fbi and the rest of them, the whole bunch of them working together. Um, and, you know, it's as you and I was just saying before we started, Karen, um, I think it's so encouraging right now today to look around at the news, to look around at what's happening on YouTube and see so many people, so many citizen journalists, journalists, real alt media journalists, that is, beginning to speak out about how the FBI is lying to the public, you know about and the las vegas police department they are lying to the public about the shooting oh yes and uh almost immediately there were reports coming out saying wait a minute um with one shooter and two rifles going off at the same time how's that how's that possible and how is it possible for a 64 year old man to bring uh an unbelievable amount of ammunition and several rifles did what did he think that he was basically going to be up there for days nobody would notice um <laughs> and it's it's just ludicrous i mean there's so many holes in that story that were immediately obvious to people and uh, uh some of the families of the supposed victims went to the hospital and were denied entry what That's you know you can't odd. come see, you know? no no we haven't set up the stage i mean we haven't you know uh <laughs> Wait a minute, we're not prepared. You know, we announced this disaster, but we didn't get the fake blood in time. It's, it'll be here anytime. Um, yeah. And there are just so many holes in it. And like I said last time, there was a neighbor of the guy who said, This is impossible. This guy isn't like it. It, it mm -hmm. isn't like that whatsoever. And there are stories coming out. Well, he used to be FBI and he used to be CIA and he used to be, well, what? That's an amazing resume. He used to be everything. Mm hmm. And the brother also who's been interviewed, I believe, uh, seems like uh, another dubious character. So they they all appear to be working, um, you know, it's sort of this, they've set up another little theatrical little skit over here and they're playing it out, just like in all the other false flag cases. Did you see that article from Paul Craig Roberts? I think there was a surgeon who wrote to him and said, you know, I've been in war zones and I've seen mass shooting. I've seen uh, scenes of carnage when shooting occurs and there was nothing. There was no blood around over here there was you know there was really this was not the scene of carnage that is um, casually being reported by the fake press so <laughs> so there's all sorts of holes in in the in the so-called official stories and i'm glad they're coming out because perhaps this is the turning point and perhaps this is going to make a difference in this country in terms of hope so. calling the FBI on um, false flags and domestic terror that they create themselves. Right. So I'm so glad to see Chris here. There we go. Hello. Hi. Hi, Chris. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We could see you a minute ago too, and you've kind of, your <laughs> video has vanished. Oh, there you are. Back oh, there again. you go. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi, to see, good to see you, Chris. You know, as you see, we are sort of thin on the panel panel today because um, Catherine's traveling. And, oh, I should have mentioned this earlier at the beginning of the show, but Paul and Mindy are not here with us this morning because Mindy suffered a loss in her family. Her father passed away, so they are taking care of, you know, family issues related to that. Sorry um, to hear that. Yes, um, we are too. And uh, Millicent did say she would join us a little bit later. She hasn't joined us as yet. I wonder what's going on. I was speaking to her yesterday and there were issues with the phone back and forth. Um, so this guy who is able to hack into her head also hacks frequently into her electronics, you know, into her phone. So, yeah. Well, it's just lovely that the uh, military takes almost anybody into their programs, whether they're psychopaths or not. You know, and then gives them, uh, you know, high, high, high sci-fi type technology and then doesn't care if they take it home with them to use as they please. So that's, yes, that's and, just lovely. 
And I think, Chris, what um, Karen's referring to is that guy, Randy Webster, who was doing this to, to Millicent and, uh, you know, whom I wrote about in my article. Of course, he was named at that time anonymously as Barrett Wolf. So now I think everybody knows that Barrett Wolf is Randy Webster or, or the other way around. Uh, but, <laughs> but in any case, as you say, um, they give the military and the US Air Force veterans this te terrible technology, Karen, but you know, it seems to me it, it's, there's full cognizance involved. There's full awareness because this is um, technology that comes at a very high price, right? It's very expensive. Oh yeah. I, you know, <laughs> theoretically, if you take pencils and notebooks home from a federal job, you should be prosecuted because that's taxpayer money. It's not for your use or your children's use. But apparently with the Air Force, it's OK to take high technology home to uh, torture your your um, fellow townspeople with. That's fine. But just don't take any pencils or notebooks home. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Karen, did you want to talk about your second document a little bit before we go on to the whole Voice to Skull program, which I know we can talk about with Chris now that he's here? Okay. Um, well, the second um, second flyer, two pages. Um, like I said, it's from the D it basically it's entitled the DHS H ah, sorry the DHS scam and human trafficking of innocent citizens, and I'll read maybe the first two. Uh, smaller paragraphs. Um, and so I start out saying, when the Iron Car Curtain or communism fell in 1989, Congress began slashing intelligence and military budgets, and that meant falling profits for the military industrial complex and the loss of intelligence bigwigs, immeasurable power and prestige, meaning their private kingdoms. Hence, it would appear, the intelligence community and the military industrial complex that they were in bed with decided that a new enemy had to be created to feed the war machine and to make sure the well never ran dry. An endless war was declared on secret terrorists from a well of unending targets, regular, unsuspecting citizens of the world, secretly declared terrorists without proof or even minimal probable cause. And then I go on to talk about an elaborate ruse was concocted with the 9-11 false flag, insider job, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just, it's basically a continuation of what we were just saying. I mean, we're told that XYZ uh, type of ethnicity and uh, certain countries want to kill us. Well, then why are the people on the list 99.9% .9 us? Mm -hmm. Why is it that, why is it the, uh, kindergarten teacher next door why is it the uh, truck driver why is it the journalist next door why is it the retired fed who just spent her entire life defending the country how is she a terrorist um, how is the yogi master a terrorist and people don't think you know these xyz people were told that they're the danger they have uh, a a life philosophy that tells them to kill us kill us kill us but yet we're we're trying to kill Fred Jones. We're trying to kill Mary Smith. Why? You know, well, if I'm told well, that a redheaded man is on the loose who's beating women to a pulp, then why should I look out for a Chinese guy? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. But people are not thinking. They're just so fully uh, full of fear that they've lost their ability to reason. And I think there's a desire there to do something, even though it is to our de detriment and to the detriment of the country. They don't realize it. They're just so panicked, you know, that they're not thinking and they want to take it out on somebody. And that's why I think that we should be, instead of targeted individuals, may maybe just scapegoats, you know, of some kind, because that's what it is. Because the government that's being subverted by the worst type of evil people basically is saying, oh, look over there. Look over there. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain who's ripping up the Constitution. But look at Mary Smith over here because she bought oranges yesterday. Ooh, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what they're falling for. Well, you know? they, but anyway, 
they've made it, you know, they've made it a complete Stasi situation at this point. I mean, literally, we are in 1930s Germany. Literally, our communities have been taken over. Literally, the US government has been overthrown. And as you as we were speaking about yesterday, Karen, I think there is a distinction between the word American and the word US government. The US government appears to have been overthrown from the inside. This has been a Trojan um, overthrow. It's already happened. And these um, agencies, who are supposed to be protecting us, the American populace, are doing the opposite. They are attacking us. What could that mean? It could only mean that, you know, we have been um, overthrown. Our, um, our country has been invaded. It's been invaded from the inside. It has. It has. And I, I didn't get to check the quote, but I do believe it was Abraham Lincoln who, who said that the American, American people have the right to overthrow the people within the government who are perverting the government. He didn't say overthrow the government. He said, remove the people who are the ones who are perverting and subverting the government. So he knew, he knew. And this mm -hmm. is exactly what's going on. So what they're saying to these people is that we're the government. Uh, you need to do it because we said so, don't question us. Well, that's not American. America is all about an individual responsibility, thinking for yourself, and not being a hive mind. Communism is a hive mind. Totalitarianism is a hive mind. And I've said I am so very disgusted that so many of these so-called patriots who are actually fascists, mercenary fascists, they are the ones who are flying the flag. And I said, I'll never fly that flag again. I will fly the 1776 flag with the stars in, in a circle. Because there is, there is another quote that says that a patriot is not somebody who follows his country blindly. He's the person who stands for the principles upon which the country was, uh, was founded against those people who would pervert it. And so I will basically always go with the 1776 flag because the other, uh, I'm sorry, I associate it with scum, you know, and I, I, I don't mean that... <sighs> to insult military, but right now, until these people are stopped, they are the, mostly the ones who are flying the flag as it is today, and they're making it stand for something it doesn't stand for. So I'm going back to the 1776 flag because I am showing that I stand by the Constitution, not by the perversion of it, and I will not blindly follow somebody just because he happens to be in government because there are plenty of criminals who have, like you said, infiltrated government and they know what they're doing is wrong mm -hmm. and we've we've been through this again you know according to marbury versus madison any law that is not constitutional is void and then recently you know we've we found the the uh other supreme court um ruling that basically said norton versus shelby county that if you follow the an unconstitutional law, you cannot be protected from the consequences of you trying to enforce an illegal law on somebody else. You're mm -hmm. not protected. Mm -hmm. So these people have no legs to stand on, but as long as we believe lies and go with the lies and let them uh, manipulate us into breaking the law for the government, and that ought to be a red flag, then we're not going to get out of this situation. We need people to say, wait a minute, no, that's not constitutional. That's not moral. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it. Exactly. And I will um, remind people that a gag order very often is considered unconstitutional. Especially if it's associated with that Marbury versus Madison scenario where there is a law that is running counter to the Constitution, right? Right, which is which is to be considered null and void according to Marbury versus Madison, and according to anybody who understands the Constitution, I think. Right. Um, and you know, of course, it goes also against human values, basic mm -hmm. human values, basic human rights. What's going on currently? So I think that's a very good reminder to people that mm -hmm. they need to think twice about what they are doing, because what they are doing, because currently what's happened is when our agencies have been taken over, when our agencies, when, this, when the CIA and the FBI has been taken over succinctly and completely, when the DHS is, is, has been taken over and is no longer functioning to enact homeland security, but enact domestic homeland terrorism, mm 
when the NSA is also engaged, not merely in phone surveillance, but also in all kinds of other surveillance. You know, and surveillance really is a gateway, it seems, a gateway for the military to come in and engage in these um, extreme and covert field weapon testing and uh, neuro experimentation programs. So surveillance is really being used as an excuse to permit all those atrocities on the American populace today. And um, this is where the military also comes into play. You know, the military is also acting against Americans today. So if any, anyone in the military is out there, you know, waving the American flag, I would remind them that this is what the military is doing today. The military, the Department of Defense has suddenly become the Department of Offense. And therefore, it behooves us as Americans today to actually expose this, to speak out openly about this, and to lay it bare for the rest of the country to see. Because many people simply don't know. And I know, Chris, that's a great deal of what you talked about in your interview as well. Very, very eloquently, I might add. Well, you? Uh, you know, just uh, listening to what, what you're saying, uh, one of the things that's, that's um, I'm, you know, personally having to kind of think about as I'm, you know, as the days and years go on and on in this program is, is, uh, you know, why, why they're actually doing this. And, you know, um, they, they, you know, the, the torturers talk to me all the time and, and you can't believe a, a single thing they're saying, but, you know, they always refer back to this um, arms race, this covert arms race uh, that's taking place to ensure, uh, you know, it's a Manhattan district sort of, you know, uh, project that uh, is uh, is a race to the to the end game, which is the most advanced neuro weapons uh, uh, that the country can come up with. But um, you know, if you are looking at it from a, a patriotic point of view, and that you know uh, thousands of people, scientists, and then you know how however many uh, victims like myself and, and 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 other TIs are involved in this program. You have to always pay attention to what exactly is being created here. You know, this isn't just a, a program that's ramping up neural weapons to a degree that will allow them to brag about, you know, having the best, most capable neural weapons on the planet. They're already way past the point at which a person can be knocked down or stunned or, you know, um, frozen in place. Um, you know, they're talking about imperceptible takeovers. And they've, so they've created this arbitrary point where uh, they need to get to um, in the development of these weapons. And, uh, and, but, and, and, and that supposedly is, is the apex of the development. And then that's going to give them all of the power in the world and wars will be fought without, you know, conventional weapons from that point on. You know, what they've actually done is they've created this pool of people called TIs, which is a Soviet era psycho prison. You know, this is a group of people that are not being believed and uh, they can throw any number of people, as long as it doesn't spike the statistics in any one you know, particular mental uh, illness or some health effect, uh, they can throw in thousands of people into this pool of TIs and they're just going to disappear. Their stories will be diluted by everybody else's. And so when you think about, well, even if it is this arms race in the most peaceful time in human history that is creating these neuro weapons to such a degree that they can you know, have bragging rights and claim, well, our neuro weapons can take you over imperceptibly and you won't be able to know the difference. And that's what we've chosen as, as, you know, the, as, 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 a, as a fully functional, you know, uh, go to war with sort of weapon, uh, what they've actually done is they've created this, this, this psycho prison. They've created the infrastructure around themselves to put any American into this program. And as long as they're not going public, as long as US officials in response to these Cuba attacks keep saying that uh, you know, they're health attacks and, and you know, we think they're sonic weapons. Well, sonic weapons don't do these things. When you're, they ask you know, engineers who are specialists in sonic weapons, they say, well, you would need X amount of power to, to, to actually, uh, you know, hurt, uh, to uh, disrupt somebody's internal, you know, uh, or to damage their brain, uh, to, you know, to, to create physical damage in somebody. And that's true because they're not sonic weapons. They're neuro weapons. So 
it's very frustrating being an American, being put into this program and having to, you know, uh, rectify, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, these these thoughts uh, in my head all the time about why we're all being put into this program. And uh, and, and and just like Karen said, it's uh, it's this isn't something patriots when they understand the full extent of these programs would ever would ever support. Um, they have to understand that this is an arms race, but our the weapons that have been created are are already more than capable of 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 rendering you know millions of troops uh, uh, speechless, um, motionless. Uh, unable to perform, unable to fight. So why are we still in the program? There's something more to it. There's something more to it. Mm -hmm. Uh That's really really powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh, look, my audio is being messed with again. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's like I can hear an echo when I'm talking. Can you hear me all right? You're good. Heard you well. Yes, your audio is pretty good, Chris. Yeah. Okay, so they backed off a little bit. Um, I don't know why they feel they need to show their hand every now and then. Um, But um, that was very powerful. And what you say, you know, it's it's not an issue of patriotism. And that's what, you know, something that we need to talk about. The Voice to Skull program, as you describe it, completely beginning to end seems to be a torture program. That has that could poss- could have nothing possibly to do with anything that's American. We were talking about the notion of what is um, being American. What does the term American suggest? You know, what uh, what are classic American values? And I'm sorry, but torture is not a classic American value. It's I think a classic CIA value, and that is not American. No. No, and that that's the danger of having an. Uh, congressional and Senate oversight committees that don't do their jobs. I mean, countless times I've seen them call somebody up from the NSA or CIA or whatever, ask them a question, and then the person being asked the question said, you don't have the need to know. You don't have the clearance. I'm like, why would somebody who's in the oversight committee not have a clearance to do his job in oversight? And if they come back and say, well, you know, Senator so-and-so or Congressman so-and-so has this or that on their record, okay, then they shouldn't be on the oversight committee now, should they? Mm-hmm. So this can what be is rectified. An oversight, yeah, what is an oversight committee, actually? What does it actually do? What does it accomplish? I don't see evidence of accomplishment in these Senate intelligence and oversight committees. They're not really doing anything. No, no. You can't be told you don't have the need to know and then say, oh, okay, fine, then continue as you were. Mm -hmm. That's not oversight, you know, and it just blew me away when I saw the NSA people get up in front of Congress and talk about 9-11, because what they told the congressman was entirely different from what the NSA people inside NSA knew and spoke about, because we couldn't understand why these analysts were told to shut up and not to report the warnings for 9-11 when they said we could have stopped the entire thing. But then... General Hayden gets up in front of the Congress and says, no, we didn't know. Sorry, caught us unaware. So where were you? Because the analysts knew and they sent up the the reports to you. And then they were told to shut up or be fired. Which really so tells gotten you. Away. Yeah, the corruption yeah. is at the top. The corruption is at the top. It's in top management. That's the takeover. Yeah. So the guys who've taken over this country are at the very top. And they're in positions of power. You know, and we, we actually know their names. They occupied the very top positions, the head positions in Intel. And the well, I can, I can they are the war that, criminal. Yes, yes. I can tell you that personally, William Black Jr. is the person who put me in this program. He was the um, deputy director of NSA, and over him was General Hayden. And Sherry Guarneri will tell you that he's part of her torture and harassment. So those are the two top NSA people during a certain number of years, and we know they're complicit. So how many well, others are? And, and what is it? This is assault by neuroweapons development program. You know, this, these are two different things happening at once, and they've combined to become just this free-for-all. But what I, you know, I feel that 
uh, Karen and Sherry and so many others and myself are victims of not, of, you know, this wasn't um, a lottery where people were selected uh, randomly to be part of this human, this non-consensual human experimentation program, which is, you know, the most disgusting thing I could ever, you know, um, you know, say about America, but we know what's happened so many times before. You know, this is assault by experimentation program. People are being thrown into this for revenge. And, um, you know, and people need to be aware of that. This is a classified exactly. program. You know, if we're familiar with the common rule uh, th that governs uh, human experimentation uh, by uh, federally funded research, uh, there have to be internal review boards and informed consent. This is the focus of the common rule that Bill Clinton's advisory commission uh, wrote, you know, uh, uh, about uh, throughout their 800 page report. So, um, yes, however, but, even the common rule has been bastardized and compromised, um, Chris. You know, yeah. now there are waivers for uh, there are waivers. informed Classified and non federally funded research are the two, you know, loopholes in that law. So they've created this, you know, uh, weapons program, this, co this, this, uh, this covert, you know, Manhattan district style weapons program uh, using those, the, 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 the fact that it's classified research and probably, and, and non-federally funded, at least probably f privately funded now, but then sold off later in the chunk, you know, in chunks to the federal government. Um, but, uh, you know, as, a, uh, as an excuse, to, 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 to create this pool of, of victims into which they can throw anyone they want to. So, and compartmentalize and keep it all secret and call it all in the interest of national security. Literally, they are running a torture program and they are calling it secret for reason of national security. They need to be yeah. skewered. Yeah. Well, and they, they, yeah. they torture at, at um, you know, uh, as this kind of the, the common thread, the, the daily, uh, you know, um, uh, conversation uh, that takes place throughout these experiments. It's all about torture. People really need to understand that these programs are about driving people to suicide, to the brink of death, and then maybe pulling it back just a little bit, but keeping them on the razor's edge between life and suicide ideation. And they're claiming, well, we need it because the brain, uh, you know, explodes with action when it's, it's traumatized. You know, the, the neurons light up like a Christmas tree when we see that. No, no, no. You know, they, the programs that, that they're, you know, the, the experiments they're performing on me and the torture te techniques they're using, they repeat all the time. And now they're developing new ones that are neuroweapon specific. So these are thought injections and thought mirroring and, and thought reflection, which is, unbearable you can't think about something else when, when this is happening these are things that are being injected you know right into your brain and you can't go anywhere else so we have the traditional cia torture techniques and then we have these neuroweapon specific torture techniques that are that are now being developed so uh this is a, a, a yes. graduation in the torture program that unlike you know uh, that, that nobody would ever believe is happening unless you were victimized by it it sounds like it's an intensifying and an escalation of torture techniques above and beyond what's in the Kubrick manual, what's in the HRETM manual, what's in the, you know, the KGB techniques that you showed me and um, has uh, so brilliantly developed and uses, and uh, which Mitchell and Jessen used as well in Guantanamo. So, um, and you're talking about a new set of torture techniques that not merely builds on these horrific sets of tortures, but, you know, takes everything to a higher level and a newer level. And, you know, you do describe that so closely in the interview, um, Chris, so I do encourage everyone to wait for the interview because it, it's very closely described. And uh, sort of in gist, I could possibly say that what it really is, is when um, these kinds of tortures are literally military-induced voices that start chanting and start replaying and start engaging in conversations each time you take a breath or each time you try to think of a thought of your own, 
that has anything to do with um, anything outside this realm of what they are struggling to put you push you into because they're trying to sort of keep your thinking within a certain space right yeah they this is um you know uh, for the first 10 years of my torture it was voice to skull voices yeah uh, and they used different psychological torture techniques uh, throughout that period to create fear and anxiety and all of those things. Over the last three years, they've been torturing me with electromagnetic specific torture techniques. This is different. This is still, of course, applying this notion that you're going to be killed through torture. You're not going to make it through all of these things. That still exists. But these are wep these 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 weapons are uh, transmitting. Uh, uh, information, uh, neuro that, that affects whether it's stronger than the 0.5 milliwatts that, 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 your, uh, that your neurons fire at, the electricity that's used to, to fire a neuron, or it's just the frequency oscillation, uh, you know, that, that they're controlling. Um, uh, it is more powerful than, than you, than, 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 the, uh, than the charge, uh, than the electromagnetic field that, 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 that the human body creates naturally. It's a more ch powerful charge. It's like, uh, it's like being hit with a taser. When you're hit with a taser, you're not doing anything else. You are frozen. That's the way it is with your brain. They, when they transmit these frequencies into you, and they can represent thoughts, they can represent images, they can represent uh, body movements. Um, they're stronger than your natural than the, than, than the charges or than the, 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 um, the, the intensity that your, your natural electromagnetic magnetic field creates. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not a PhD, I'm not a scientist, so I, it's hard for me to describe it, but I can describe very well the feeling. It, these are not thoughts that you can just um, ignore. Uh, people say to me, well, why don't you just not respond back to the tortures? Well, I'll tell you why, because they're in teams of four or more people attached to one person and they are, are, are tied into every single thing you're thinking on a second by second basis. So it's one thing to try not to think about something for you know a uh, half an hour or an hour. I mean, try that sometime. It's very difficult to do, but some people can, can do it to a degree. But we're talking about hour after hour after hour and what they've developed with these torture techniques are ways to elicit thoughts from you. So you mentioned the breathing torture. That's a torture they do where every time you exhale, they'll uh, emit, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll send us a, a, a command through you or, or just a, a statement like uh, pain and torture, Chris. That's something they use all the time. Pain and torture, pain and torture. Well, it's one thing to, to deal with that for, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, which is difficult. But to deal with it for half an hour, an hour, eventually you are worn down and, and, and your mind automatically starts uh, reflexively putting out thoughts. Why are you doing this? Why, you know, can't you stop? Why are you such bastards? You know, whatever the thing is, that whatever thought is elicited. And then as soon as that thought's elicited, they will reflect it. Go to hell, Chris. You know, uh, uh, you know, that's why we're doing it. We're torturers, Chris. We're professional torturers. That's what torture is, Chris. It's pain and suffering. So you can get into these, uh, these, these, um, these circular, you know, uh, kinds of situations um, where, uh, you know, they're eliciting thoughts. You respond. They elicit back. And pretty soon uh, that, that becomes the torture, this back and forth that goes on for you know hours at times and and it never it never stops you can stop you know you can you can quit kind of playing the game which is not a game but you can try to hold your thoughts but they will continue doing things to elicit more thoughts from you that's a huge part of these electromagnetic specific tortures is eliciting more thoughts from you and pre and, and the other day they did something to me that was just horrendous they were torturing me so hard with these thought injections and eliciting thoughts that, you know, and when you think about eliciting a thought, all you have to do is imagine just the very beginning of a thought or a memory, and they can recall that uh, and, and identify it. And then 
ref, uh, send it back to you in a different person's voice. Chris is thinking about his friend uh, Karen, uh, his friend David from high school. Chris is thinking about you know baseball and and playing at, at, at Chatfield, you know, high school. And and all I did was just just you know for a millisecond, kind of you know glimpse, just glimpse that thought, and they've already fed it in to their system. They already know what it is because I think everything's offloaded to a, to a, a database and you do a lot of thinking through that database. But you end up just becoming this kind of vessel for them playing these thought elicit, elicitation you know, games. And at one point I sat there and I couldn't control a single thing I was thinking about. It was just, my brain was spurting thoughts all over the place. It was as if, it, it felt as if I was going mad but it's all computer oh, no. control. And, and that's just a torture. That's just one simple torture technique they use, you know? But it's all about torture. That's what people need to understand about these voice to skull <laughs> programs, especially. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's, it is about torture. It is taking people to the brink of death and, uh, and, and to suicide ideation. And people have to be careful what they say, because if you say, well, I felt suicidal, you could get thrown into a, into a, into a, a hospital for that. So we're, you know, it's a catch-22 for us. You know, we can't come out and say exactly what, how terrible these programs are making us feel. We have to do things like what I did, which is threaten suicide, you know, threaten suicide. And Karen, I, I you know, this is detailed in my, in, in this interview. And, um, you know, it's great speaking with you and you are, uh, you know, such a important person for all of us because, you know, we need people who can describe these tortures and can describe what people like myself are doing to try to get out of them. You know, um, I had to threaten suicide and uh, to, to, you know, the, we're at, at their mercy. And if we can't communicate this to these people and, 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 create a change on the inside of these torture cells. They call them torture cells, torture dens is used quite often to describe these are the teams of, you know, four or five or more people that are put onto one victim, monitor their thoughts constantly. Um, if we can't, uh, you know, appeal to their humanity, then, then we're done for. And so those are the games that we're playing victims are with their torturers all day long, trying to appeal to their humanity and explain to them, why are you doing this to me over and over? But by threatening suicide, you put them into the position of actually being responsible for your death. And I uh, found a four-story parking garage in, in Palo Alto uh, that had a parking barrier along the, the, the perimeter of it. And I climbed up onto the parking barrier, which is like a railing, and balanced uh, on top of that railing and promised the voice to scholars that if they did not stop torturing me, I would walk another 100 feet down the railing. And I kept doing this night after night and for about a week. And they would continue talking. But it was very scary. And uh, each time I, com I completed these walks, and this is without stumbling or falling off, you know, in one direction I could fall off into the parking garage. But the other direction, I'd fall four stories onto, pave, onto pavement, on, onto a sidewalk. So I, pro I told them, I'm not going, you know, if I, if I stumble off to the left, I'll start over again from the beginning. And so you can't walk leaning over. You have to walk balanced to, to make, you know, the, the entire walk. So you're doing these things so they understand that you are risking your life unless they stop torturing you. And they, they did this. Um, they kept talking. But every time I'd get up, you know, they would, they would, they were nervous. Well, oh, here comes, you know, Chris is getting up there again, and oh, here we go, guys. And uh, but Chris, this is what torture is. You know, you just have to understand. This is what torture is. It's never going to stop for you. And so you're up there, and you say, okay, well, I'm going to push you as hard as I can, and you keep walking. And and I, I did this for a week straight, and finally, I I, I got to a thousand feet that I promised to walk without falling, and. Um, I wasn't, when I was on the railing, I would kind of keep my hands to my side and my legs were shaking like a leaf. And this is when they were introducing biorobotization technology to me. Um, about a week before that, I was eating outside and they were spinning a fork in my right hand. And I'm left-handed. And I can barely spin 
you know, a pencil or something in my left hand, but they were spinning a fork perfectly in my right hand. And I was just looking at it. I couldn't believe it. I could stop it. But then, you know, if you just kind of relax your mind, you're, there it goes again. So they were just beginning to introduce this stuff to me. When I got up on the railing, uh, I felt them put my hands out, uh, you know, extend my arms out uh, on either side. And my legs stopped shaking. And I felt myself, you know, moving down the railing, one foot in front of the other with my head looking straight out, which is, uh, which wasn't how I was walking before. I was looking down, you know. This time they put my arms out. So, you know, they helped me continue that walk. And, um, and I made it, you know. But at, at the time I thought, wow, you know, they're introducing these new technologies. This is amazing. I'm in Palo Alto. They're telling me, you know, uh, that, that, you know, they, Karen, they, they sent someone over wearing a Man Manchurian uh, candidate project sweatshirt. Uh, right around this time, he walked up to me. And when I saw that, I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm in for it here. And, um, but when they're introducing these technologies, you think, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, maybe they're just revealing everything the technology can do before they let me go. And, and that's what's going through your head the whole time. And they know that. So they extend that for, you know, for, up until today. I mean, at this very moment, they keep telling me that, you know, that, I'm part of this program that's revealing all of this technology. Uh, but I've been through all of it. I've seen it all. So they can't really surprise me with anything more except for you know, imperceptible takeovers, which is what they're doing. But they did this, and I continued threatening suicide uh, for uh, three weeks. I went to Half Moon Bay and found a rock face above the, the breaks there. And Half Moon Bay is where the, the, the Mavericks is. These are the largest waves in North America. So the waves were crashing in. And I found a rock face kind of over, you know, overlooking the waves. And, uh, but it was only about you know, five or 10 meters above some of these waves that were crashing in. And I was very scared. I was very scared. But I said, I'm staying here, torture, until you stop talking to me. You better stop torturing me. And, um, and that went on for about half an hour, an hour. And, and finally, I said, oh, OK, I'm going back. And that's, the giant wave came in and crashed, you know, covering me. And I was just able to turn around and hold on to these um, kind of pebbles. You know, you're on kind of the sandstone. And there were just enough places where I could grab onto a pebble that was sticking out of the sandstone and keep myself from being washed down this rock face. And it was death if I had fallen. So they continued doing this. And that's when finally they, they were torturing me with what you mentioned, Romola, which is the, um, the chanting. And when they chant, something to you over and over, your mind is thinking, oh my gosh, this could be automated. You know, this could be AI and they could chant you forever. And that's maddening. And the, you, you have one option. If you're strapped down to a chair, you would go insane probably. But, if you, but since we're not strapped down to a chair, the only other option is suicide. So uh, when they chant, it's like screaming in your ear. It's, it's some of the worst you know, it's one of the worst forms of electromagnetic, you know, voice to skull torture out there. And when they started chanting me, it, it, it wasn't stopping. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, look, guys, you know, um, I'm going to uh, go, I, I'm going to burn myself. If you're not going to stop chanting, I'm going to burn myself because I've tried these other things. And I wanted to put them in the position of having to make a decision. Are they all going to participate in my murder? Or are they going to back down? And they have, you know, uh, you know, determined in their minds that um, if a TI kills themselves, it's their decision. They couldn't handle the torture. But they don't know how intense their tortures are. You know, Robert Duncan talks about the probability of death, that a lot of these torture experiments are, are being conducted, you know, to, to, to create probability matrices. And what, you know, which kinds of torture create, what kinds of, you know, which, what kind of responses or, you know, and, and, and that's what they're doing. And so they don't know how painful these tortures are. They haven't gone through them. They only know through, through our actions. So in my case, I had no choice. I had to stop the chanting somehow. I bought a gallon of gasoline and took it to the beach with me and said, I'm going to do this torture. I'm going to burn myself. And they said, Chris, you know, uh, 
Chris, you know, they were kind of narrating at that point, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's always, there's always the four, you know, the same four torturers or so, but a guy named John and of course a, a woman voice um, named Deborah, and they would just kind of narrate, well, Chris is serious about this. He bought the gasoline. And Deborah, the torturer, said, well, if Chris, the day before, if Chris buys gasoline, then we're not, you know, we can't torture him anymore, voice to skull. And they always refer to themselves as voice to scullers, you know, they're voice to scullers. And so that's part of the reason why he did it, because she said that. But it, I think that was kind of, she did that to lure me into that, in, into that situation where I'd have gasoline in my hand now, you know, while they're chanting. So I went to the, to, to the uh, ocean, to, to a, a secluded part of the beach at night. Uh, and uh, poured the gas. You know, I was wearing shorts, but I, I brought a beach towel with me and tied it around myself and poured the gas around myself, uh, you know, three or four times. Um, it was at least three quarters of a, of, of a gallon of gasoline. It wasn't the entire plastic, you know, red plastic gallon container, but it was almost all of it. But enough to, to show the torturers that, you know, this is serious. You know, this is going to be uh, very painful, if not, you know, the end of my life, if you don't stop torturing me. It's the only thing I could think of. It's the only thing I could think of doing. So I pulled out my lighter and I held it in my right hand and put it an inch away from me and said, torture, you better, this is it. You better stop talking. And, you know, I was an idiot because I didn't think, I, I, they were starting to, to do the bio-robotization takeovers, spinning the fork and, you know, helping me walk down that but I didn't think they would, you know, actually use bio robotization to kill me, to hurt me. But they did. All of a sudden, I be, they put me into this trance, and I sat there and I was staring at this my the lighter in my hand, and I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't do anything. I was stuck staring at this thing, and all of a sudden, I felt my hand starting to move on its own, and my thumb started to move, you know, depress the, the top of the lighter by itself. And I couldn't move. I couldn't even think of doing anything else. This is what this technology can do. And, you know, before I could reach over with my other hand and stop it, you know, my, my thumb depressed the lighter. And I would never light myself on fire. I would never light myself on fire. That's, you know, put yourself in that situation with that much gas on you and, and, and think if you're going to light yourself on fire. And, but that's what they did because I, you know, I created that situation and I burst into flames and, you know, burned my body. I'm 40% burned from the waist down. I have skin grafts all over, uh, you know, a month in the hospital, four surgeries. I was airlifted to the, to the burn unit in Santa Clara. Thank goodness I was near the, you know, the, the, the Bay area. I was at Half Moon Bay when this happened. Um, and, and so, you know, I have to explain that story to people. I have to explain what happened to family and friends, and, 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 and this is exactly what happened. What I am telling you is the absolute truth. It's in this interview. It's in the, 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 inter the, the podcast we've done. But this is what they're doing to torture victims. So people could have committed suicide, and, it's, and, it, and, it's, you know, and the coroner marks it a suicide, but it might not have been a suicide. It's something that I'm describing. You know, they went up on top of a cliff and slipped and fell. You know, they put themselves in a dangerous situation to see if torture would help, would stop them, would stop chanting. And they didn't. So that's this, this, this razor's edge where the torturers keep us all day long, every single day. Sometimes they back down a little bit for half a day or a day, but then they'll come right back and do it again. Um, so... You know, I wanted to make sure Karen heard that story uh, because, you know, it's 100% it's true and, and what we're dealing with. And we have no way to communicate it to anybody. You know, it, it comes down to, to, to podcasts like this. So um, I hope everybody reads the interview because it, it, it talks about torture from A to Z. Um, but that's the stuff we're facing all the time, all the time. And I don't know, you know, and, and the torture is kind of, you know, played off like, well, if you're not strong enough for it, then kill yourself, you know? And it's like, well, what's the other, what's the choice? To live with constant thought injections now or chanting or other tortures? And I'd like to point out that this is happening in America in 2017. What you are actually pointing to are torture dens. 
you know, you're pointing to the ultimate secret weapon. Thanks to secrecy, thanks to the idiocy of secrecy in this country. I'm sorry, this is my opinion. I'm just freely expressing it. Um, thanks to the idiocy of secrecy in this country. Thanks to the complete cover up of everything, calling everything classified and, you know, hiding it under national security and using compartmentalization inside these agencies, keeping even the good people who are working in agencies from knowing what on earth is really going on. These black projects, which are truly black in many, many ways, you know, they're just evil. They're very dark. They're very sinister. They, there's part possibility for them to simply mushroom and grow and become these absolute monsters. This is a monster project. So the ultimate secret weapon now is taking over heads. And, you know, it's not just in America, of course, it's happening around the world, thanks to, you know, the uh, the export of American uh, weaponry and, and, and American secrecy as well. And, you know, the whole globalist octopus squid thing going on currently with the Agenda 21 and what thing going on all over the world. Uh, we've got this scenario where you have these extreme torture weapons bred in secrecy, cultivated in secrecy, mushrooming and, you know, developed in absolute secrecy, now in secret and very easily calling these people insane whenever they open their mouths and speak out about it. Off to the psychiatry ward you go, here are the anti -sacations. shut up and put up, your own family will take you there. You know, your father will take you, your brother will take you, your sister will take you. They will talk about counseling because you're talking about voices and heads not realizing that this is voice to skull, which is a documented military technology. And of course, it's been taken to extreme extents by this whole DOD conglomerate that's working together, working together to develop this deadly neuro weapon for supposed um, ends, as you mentioned, Chris, supposed arms race, we have to perfect this weapon. Why do you have to perfect a weapon that can be arrived at only through torture? What kind of you know, do we need such a weapon in our world? Yeah. Well, I think this whole thing belies the fact that they're claiming that there, there's an arms race on so we can defend ourselves from other people, but they're subjugating their own people using it. This is absolute outrageous lie. I mean, I have seen an interview where President Putin of Russia very clearly was begging in the most dignified way possible, but he was begging the Americans on the other side of the table to stop this arms race. We have parity with nuclear weapons, but now you are forcing us to develop these weapons that we don't want to, de want to develop. And he, in another interview, had said that the Russians, or I, I think at the time it was the Soviet Union, had used the voice to skull with agents in the field so that they could, they could communicate with them without being detected and they stopped using it, and I've repeated this before, but the Soviet Union cared about their agents enough to stop using this when they discovered they were giving them brain damage. And yet, our government is doing it on purpose and saying, ah, oh, well, because they have the attitude that they own us. And this is what the corporations, having infiltrated the federal government, uh, think of us. They think of us as assets, as property and they can do with us what they wish. This is not American. Mm -mm. Not at all. This is not American, and I think that's what it comes down to. You know, this is not American, and these are not American values, and yet this is happening to young Americans like Chris and other Americans all over this country. The Voice to Skull program really underlines and points out how deadly, how evil, you know, this um, black, covert, secretive, Ex human experimentation really is because it's uh, the end goals that it has are extremely dastardly. It's about the full takeover of human brains and human bodies. So it is the living Manchurian candidate program and it's very much connected to this whole, you know, false flag terrorism, mass shooting, um, FBI, CIA, Mossad setup that's going around creating false flags and um, active shooting incidents all around the country. It's all part of this domestic terrorism imbroglio. So again, it goes back to that, you know, Agenda 21, the communist takeover, the Trojan takeover. Um, it's all a means of taking over the country. You know, yesterday I was driving my daughter to her um, after school Kumon class and um, I saw, oh, Chris, it looks like there's two of you now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Okay, so um, I was driving my daughter to, you know, uh, her Kuman class, and you know how they arrange covert communications around us all the time, and I frankly don't pay much attention to it, but every so often they kind of forcefully kind of invade my field of view, and I can't help 
but see what on earth they are waving in front of my face. So yesterday, the, I passed the street, which is completely being torn up, and I see signs for uh, replacement of water lines. They're supposedly replacing water lines. They've got these huge water pipes laid out on the street, and they've got a huge number of huge trucks um, you know, clogging the street and lots of detours set up. And it was all very problematic with potholes and this and that. And I was kind of trying to navigate my way through these uh, side streets. And this guy uh, l uh, looks for my car, literally. And as I'm turning into this little side street, he's wearing a vest, you know, like a public utilities with that neon stuff that they wear these days. Than just his truck, pickup truck, I think. Just as I am turning into the street and he turns deliberately so I can see what's on the back of his vest. And what it says on the back is beta. So what, so what am I supposed to take away from that? You know, here I am interviewing Chris, doing podcasts with him, right? I'm trying to uh, reveal more of this voice to skull program with him, with the interviews and so forth. And I hear, I get a little message that says beta. So is this the beta test for everybody in America, everybody in the world? Is this their plan for humanity? And I would emphasize that because a lot of people may know about this and go, okay, it's just those people. There's something wrong with those people or they've done something bad. No, I have not yet met a wrongfully targeted individual who has any type of crime in their background. And as far as I can tell, the vast majority are people you would be very proud to have as friends. I mean, some of them, uh, I think just have been pushed to the edge and that that would be the minority uh, of people that I may not associate with, but I don't blame them. I think they've been pushed to the edge through a set of circumstances they would never in their lives have encountered and probably would have been perfectly normal, decent people all the rest of their lives. Um, but every so often, some of them get a little nasty and sus. I mean, you know, be, they're suspicious and accusing, but that's the program. That's just that this person ran out of patience and ability to endure. Yes, and not only that, Karen, see, actually you've brought up another aspect of this program, of this mind control program that's being used on TIs and also on V2K um, victims, you know, both. Um, and that is subliminal voice voices and sublim sublim subliminal messaging, thought infusion, thought injection, taking over of one's mental and cogitational processes. In other words, at, we're at a point where one's thoughts cannot be said to be one's own entirely. So they literally are at the point where they are mapping neural networks where they could start insinuating thoughts into people's heads. You know, so the whole Myron May thing, for instance, you know, that guy actually went out and shot people in a library. And prior to that, I think he sent out emails or tw tweets or something like that to the extent uh, of, um, you know, have you, has anyone else encountered this where you've been told that if you kill someone or if you shoot someone, uh, you're going to be better off, that this program is going to recede or whatever. He actually asked that question publicly. And I think Rohini Basaser, the woman in Canada who engaged in the stabbing, she also asked a similar question in an email. So you, And these are very good people who fought for their, who've spoken out, and who by, the, by dint of their own work record in the past and by their own, you know, um, uh, confessions say that they, ha that they are good people, that they do not have bad feelings toward other humans. And yet they've come to a point in time where they have these terrible thoughts about killing other people or shooting other people. So what's to say that those thoughts were really not their own, that they were put in there, that they were injected into their brains? You know, because this is about neural mapping. This is about neural network mapping and neural network takeover. You know, and there are so many ways, I understand, so many different neurotech ways of injecting thought, whether it's through a BCI chip or through radio hypnosis or through this whole a program that Chris is explaining, the whole you know, cloning, heterodyning one, thing. One of the things I've noticed is that you know, I, I've said in this interview and, and, and to you, Ramola, when we've spoken about it, that uh, I've always been able to tell when they're doing thought injection, uh, you know, of course, with the biorobotization. Um, it's very apparent. You know it's happening 100%. But they're moving toward imperceptible thought. 
injection. And some of those things are difficult. Um, they'll swirl around thoughts when you're on the hive mind and you'll wonder, you know, which, you know, a, a few times, which ones are yours. But what I have noticed, uh, one of the things they did to me is I used to, uh, they, they threatened my life if I did not uh, get out of IT consulting, which was my industry. I had founded two companies, two multi-million dollar companies. The second one was on its way to becoming multi-million. And they said, that's it, Chris, we're going to kill you if you continue working in your industry. And so I had to quit. And I was day trading at the time. And, and, and they made it impossible for me to think about my stocks. I was, at that point, I started a, a charity fundraising company in the pet industry uh, to kind of wave the white flag and to make sure it, to partner with a bunch of charities, executive directors that I thought you know, would speak up for me if this ever came out um, and who I thought the chain of command on their end would have to kind of explain to their, you know, uh, to their superiors. Um, but that was just you know, my only thing I could think of doing at the time. I, I, I regret it now. I wish I had taken my money and done something else, but uh, you're always trying to work this out with your torturers. Um, but they made it impossible for me to think about my stocks. And when the recession hit, I was literally working day to day. I'm voice discalled constantly, nonstop, but I'm working on, the, on my charity fundraising company. And, I'm, and the whole notion of my stocks being out there during the recession, some of which were on margin, a good number of which I had been trading on margin, just completely escaped my mind. And, I, and so I think that they can kind of uh, prohibit you, um, restrict your thinking. They can almost take thoughts and uh, remove them or take uh, a, a, you know, a, a reservoir of information um, uh, and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, created, you know, I, I put, a, put a firm wall, you know, uh, establish some kind of block that prohibits you from thinking about that particular person. That, I've noticed that a lot about being on this brain to, com to, to computer interface. Um, you know, I, for instance, I have a friend named Brian, um, and, and I'll give you another instance. Uh, I went to an elementary school in, in Morrison, Colorado. I can think of three things that happened, three stories. When I think of this, of Red Rocks Elementary, where I went, my brain can only connect with three different stories from Red Rocks. Um, and same with uh, college. I can only re recall maybe two stories, three stories, um, maybe four or so if I really think about it. Um, they come, you know, you get a little bit more. If you just sit and think forever, then you can recall a little bit more. But immediately, I can recall three or four stories from college, from four years, you know. Um, and same with my, my, most of my youth. They, you, they, they spend all of this time kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, databasing, let's just say, your thoughts, your inventory. Um, and so eventually, I think they, you're thinking through this thought, this brain-to-computer interface, and they can play games with you. They can create, they can write algorithms that kind of are designed to mess with you. Um, and, and you know they're doing it because uh, they're, you know, they're always torturing you with their own sense of humor. It's, it's fun to them. Torture to them is just psychopathic fun to them. But when I think of a friend of mine, a good friend that I've known for 10, 12 years, we've had tons of stories together. When I think of his name, Brian Poole, they create a, a, a phallic symbol. They send me a phallic symbol um, in my mind whenever I think of Brian. And we're both heterosexuals. I've never seen Brian, you know, or anything like that. I was in his wedding and all of that. But just for fun, they've attached this, this phallic symbol picture to Brian, to the thought of Brian. So that's the stuff that they can do. And that's the, the, how precisely they can control your thoughts. So, so I think going back to uh, some of you know, the things that happen is that people can create anger inside of themselves, but then they are being prohibited from thinking about the alternative to the anger. You know, what else can I do to stop this? I think they can prohibit those thoughts from happening. So they can inject thoughts. But to me, the thoughts they inject, they're just, you know, the, the thoughts they inject are words. They haven't been able to inject a complete thought. Like, Chris, go to the car and pick and take the groceries out of the trunk. You know, that's a complete thought to me, a complete thought, you know, a complete action. They haven't been able to 
to inject something like that. They can inject a sentence, Chris, go to the car and pick up the, you know, get your mom's purse from the trunk or, you know, wh whatever they're trying to do, the bag you left in the back seat. Uh, but they can't inspire that in just one injected thought. What they're doing is they're communicating words to you. It's like thinking out loud, it's, you know. So I think in words, you know. Uh, people in this program for a long time, they just start thinking in words all the time. So it's interesting, you know, they, they can prohibit you from thinking about specific things. They've done it to me in a few different instances. Um, uh, my sister, I've grown up with my sister. She's four year, years apart from me. And I, only, I can only think about a, a few things having to do with my sister, a few stories. And I think they create this database of, of your experiences and your memories. And then they can kind of, you know, um, do these experiments, you know, using this, are you going to go left with that thought or right with that thought? You know, what is your brain choosing to do? How is it, you know, what's inspiring your thoughts? What are the subliminal thoughts that go into inspiring you going left or right with that thought? Um, you know, the origin of thought. They're trying to get to those kinds of levels. But, but you know, our experiences are so vast that I don't think they have the, man, the, the, the processing power to really handle, uh, you know, uh, uh, your whole inventory of memories. So they reduce it down. They reduce it down to just kind of simple memories. So just something I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm communicating about my experiences. But it's very frustrating, Karen. You know, uh, you, when these Cuban diplomats mention um, uh, having problems recalling words, you know, um, that's the same. That's what the problem I'm having in a big way. Um, I have a problem um, with simple math. It's almost like they can put a barrier, uh, restrict your access to certain parts of your cerebral cortex that are essential for, you know, complex thinking or for, uh, for math, for example. Um, it's not like schizophrenia where you can't explain the proverb like, uh, why do people, why is it dangerous to throw uh, rocks in a glass house? You know, that's always kind of, uh, that's one of the tests for schizophrenia. That's, that's the thinking disorder. This is having uh, making it impossible to do a simple math problem or to spell. I can't spell at all now and I can't do simple math and I'm a finance major from college. So those things, that functionality has been taken from me. Stolen, um, yet, yet more stolen. stolen from people. Yeah. Yes, and this is an example of how a program can can come in. You know, a weapons program can come in and totally destroy a human being, destroy a human being's personality, and destroy a human being's brain. And this is being so-called tested on Americans. You know, let's underline that for the whole world to hear. This is absolute idiocy. And the this the implication over here is that literally it could be applied to anybody at so many different levels you know if a computer is involved and literally what you're talking about is the brain being downloaded to a computer and the computer now running the human computer brain you see so the brain's been computerized digitized entirely and this supercomputer out there is going to be running the human computer the human, in other words, is being completely robotized in this fashion, being taken over. And if they can demonstrate it on one person, you know, they're going to feel comfortable about doing it to more than well, one and, person, which they already are the doing, thing, right? And the, the danger, and uh, if I can just get this, you know, uh, mention this, is that um, uh, this is still, you know, early 21st century technology. This is 2017, you know, DARPA-esque technology. And so they're using uh, your, the, the way they, they relate uh, or input to the computer, you know, a thought is words. They're translating words. So you're, you know, if you kind of think about um, thinking out loud, um, you know, or, or uh, uh, staring off into space, those are kinds of, that's kind of the feeling you're in when you're communicating in the hive mind or on voice to skull. Um, they're not sharing your, your knowledge base. You're, you're, you're not sharing the ability to work out a complex math problem, for, for example, um, with somebody else on the hive mind. You're not accessing their repository of information, the books they've read, you know, all of that stuff. It's nothing close to that. They are just at the point where they can allow you to kind of share verbally 
the things that are going through that part of your mind, you know, where, where speech, you know, um, you know, is concentrated, you know, that's, that's the limits of their technology. So um, they can do other things. And we're talking about you know, imperceptible thought injection. But I think that a lot of that requires a clone, you know, a person who is thinking for you and they're just overlaying your mind with their, with their thoughts. That's, that's a little different than injecting a thought into a separate human being and letting it stay there, you know, uh, allowing it to kind of be learned or absorbed or, you know, uh, assimilated by the, by the person's mind. That's something I think much more advanced, um, which I'm sure they're working on. But I think when they take people over, you know, the clone, they can overlay that, that clone's, you know, movements um, uh, on, onto yours. And so I think that's a kind of an earlier stage. You know, we're at an earlier phase of this technology. But what's important is there's no ending to it. There's no end to what they can tell their superiors like the capability of a neural weapon might be, which keeps us in this, you know, classified, you know, torture program uh, for, you know, eternity. I mean, for the end of, through the end of our lives, because there's no stopping it. There'll always, there'll always be another level to this technology that will give them the best, you know, neural weapons on the planet. And that's what's so hopeful, makes our lives, my life and other TI's lives so hopeless. I mean, it's hopeless for us. Exactly. And ultimately what's happened is, you know, you've been kind of guinea pigged or lab ratted. You've just been taken over without consent. You've been taken over without consent. This is a completely non-consensual, extremely invasive human experimentation program. But the harm is absolutely astronomical. The harm to the human who is being, who is being tested on, who is being subjected to this torture which is, you know, going by another name, and that name is research project or normative surveillance and uh, intelligence experimentation, uh, sources and methods of gathering intelligence, and all this other nonsense. You know, these are the lies. These are the big fat lies that they're hiding these deadly programs under. Well, and they can't say that, well, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, well, we're letting you do the interview, Chris. So, you know, part of us, you know, part of this is to get the information out there. But, you know, you look at how difficult it is to communicate these things. They make it so confusing that, you know, to, to have five minutes or 10 minutes to explain it to somebody is, is, it's almost just a joke to them to see how far we can get. You know, it takes time to explain. It took me years to figure out the protocol and what they were doing with these treatments you know, and all of these, and then to find these CIA torture techniques from the Kubark and, and HRE TM manual and all of this, you know, to connect the dots. But it's hard to describe this. And they can hit you with frequencies that freeze your mind at any time. You know, when I was at work, I was working for a startup uh, a couple years ago in the Bay Area, an, an electronic vehicle company, electric vehicle company. Um, and, you know, in, 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 it was the only job in, that's related to IT I could get into, you know, recruiting. And so I'm firing off emails, you know, left and right, blah, 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 talking to candidates. And then all of a sudden, bam, out of nowhere, they just can freeze your mind and make you do things that are just unbelievable. Um, one time I'm on the phone and they were kind of leading up to this, you know, they were, uh, I, you know, this was after I was burned. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is before the burning. This is before the burning. Um, but they had been torturing me with a, a pretty severe torture, keeping me up at night. So I knew, you know, that, uh, you know, life at this company was going to be very difficult from, th from that point forward. But um, I was on the phone with somebody who I intended to call the next day. And I said, uh, okay, uh, sounds good. I'll give you a call yesterday. You know, just out of the blue. And they did that to kind of frighten me. It was the first time they rearranged my words like that. And I thought they had, were destroying my brain. I thought, oh my God, they're destroying my neural pathways somehow. Um, and then other times I would I'd be typing away and then they'd make it all of a sudden in a snap of a finger, I'm, I can't, figure, I can't un figure out the grammar involved in, the, in a three sentence paragraph. I don't know which word to put in front of the other. And it would literally, ta li li literally take me 45 minutes to type out um, a three to four sentence paragraph, simple email to a candidate telling them to, you know, I'll give them a call, you know, or the, to, for asking them for my, their resume or something like that. And so 
when you're in that situation and you've been tortured as long as I have for 13 years straight with these nonstop, you know, binded conversations, which are like commercials playing all the time. You can't possibly remember them all. They're just distracting and, 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 and being unable to take in other information, you, uh, reading and things like that. Um, you know, look at the position we're in when we are the ones having to describe this to other people. You know, we're the ones, you know, doing the podcasts and we're the ones having to, to write these things. And so, you know, um, you know, and, and, and we're also being tortured through the whole thing. And, and, and Yes. And, and let me point out, Chris, that's a very important point. And uh, while this is happening, there are people inside these programs, obviously, right, obviously in the DOD, the CIA, the DIA, the NSA, the DHS, who know perfectly well what's going on, who know exactly what's going on, who know that this is torture, who know that this is extreme human rights violation, and who are sitting on their hands and doing nothing and expecting us, you know, those of us who are standing up and speaking out about these horrors, expecting us to do the heavy lifting to bring these programs out into the light of day, because uh, literally we are the new church committee. We are the ones who are bringing this out. We are exposing this. Every minute, every time we stand up here and we speak out and we talk about what's really going on. And then we, you know, we, fin we finish up the broadcast and we go back to our lives and we are hit with major COINTELPRO on the streets. We're hit with major covert com communications to the effect that we are leaking classified information. I get a lot of leak symbolism and leak imagery around me. And then a lot of gag imagery, like keep your mouth shut and walk about. And then a lot of people walking red, wearing red walking uh, around me and cars, cars and pickup trucks and trucks and red suddenly crossing my path. Sorry, I don't know what red is. Red is one of my favorite colors and I really don't see what you're trying to tell me. So buzz off, you know? So that's my yeah. response because basically that's what they're trying to do. So we close our broadcast. We are given all this deadly symbolism to the extent that we don't speak about it. Well, if we don't speak about it, who exactly is going to speak about it? I don't really see CIA whistleblowers coming out of the woodwork here. It, it, as they it, should they take, they take advantage of your truth your honesty you know your honor as a person you know when someone asks you a question about this you tell them the truth you try to describe every part of this and when they create so much confusion you know an honest person is going to try to explain the people in the red shirts and they're going to try to explain these things that they're seeing you know that they they're understanding are happening to them you know um and, and so when they create, you know, all of this confusion, you know, uh, it's the stories that it becomes nonlinear. I mean, it, it's, it's, you bounces all over the place trying to explain these things. So, you know, they take advantage of that. And, you know, we need help, you know, uh, presenting the patterns that, that everybody, you know, ha you know, can pull out of these torture scenarios and the gang stalking scenarios. What are the patterns? The same things are happening to everybody. It's amazing to me when I try to explain this torture to people and I put it in simple terms, you know, what I think are simple terms. 10 years of voice to skull, you know, three years of that was only done in my loft and in my car, which made me think there were transmitters, you know, planted in the walls and in my car somehow. And then seven, six or seven years of that was, was voice to skull conversations, mirrored conversations, um, that were broadcast into my head, but they were people having a conversation about me. They weren't speaking directly to me. And then after seven years, it became direct conversations with the voice to skull. And then from that point, and then that's using the, creating the treatments that we talk about in the interview, all of the torture techniques. <laughs> but then uh, from that point, it went to what a lot of victims are talking about, or speech, people talking through you. You know, your hands moving, the sexual stimulation, you know, uh, the thought dream injections, you know, this is the same exact pattern we're all dealing with, you know, and, and, and I can't believe when you tell somebody, uh, Karen, there's a part of my story around the time they were introducing biorobotization when they asked me to pull over my car in Palo Alto and I pulled over and they said, Chris, we're going to test some waves out on you. And they said, okay, here's the first wave. Uh, and all of a sudden, my left hand started shaking like this, just like this, but even faster at a perfect interval. 
uh, you know, mathematically perfect interval, like a pulse, you know. And they did that for four minutes, and then, and then they stopped. And I, I, I would try to tighten my fist, but I would go, it would, it would look like this. This is what it would, would happen. And, and then they said, Chris, we're going to hit you with another wave. And all of a sudden, my hand, arm, entire arm started hitting me and myself in the chest, started whacking my, my upper torso. And they did that for five minutes. And then they said, Chris, now we're going to hit you with what's called the gas pedal wave. And then all of a sudden, my right foot started extending, you know, uh, the ball of my foot extending to the, to the floor and back up. And they did that, you know, 20, 30 times. And then they said, Chris, and, and now we're going to hit you, and now we're going to try the, uh, another wave out on you. And uh, this wave made me, my entire torso thrust itself against the steering wheel and back into my seat. Over and over and over for about 15 or 20 minutes, I thought they were killing me off at this point. And, you know, I, tears started, you know, rolling down my cheeks. And, and this was before, you know, they introduced a lot of this other technology. So that, that felt like an analog wave, like something someone had just kind of stumbled across somehow, you know, tuning things, you know, that they found these waves that could make, you know, your body do these certain things. And then they, they, they you know, they worked on them, you know, they tweaked them a little bit. I didn't realize that at that point that they were actually able to control your entire body with the precision of a, of a dancer, you know, or something like that. So when you explain these stories, you know, I want to go into, well, how much more they, they took me over. And the fact they did this Manchurian candidate transformation on me in the hotel room, which I talk about in the interview, but just that story about having to pull over your car and having these, your body shook like that, what are people thinking when they hear stories like that? That I'm just making it up? I just gave up a, a, a you know, a, a wonderful career and friendships and all of this to, to go out and then talk about stories like this? I'm just making it up? I mean, what do people right. think about? It's, you know, Karen, it's so frustrating when you, when you have stories like this that are out there and people just close their, it's a brain block of some, some I, don't, I don't understand it. It just can't get past it. It goes it back, goes to, back to control, control. And, it and it has to go, go back to back. mass mind control. Because literally people do not know the extent of the technologies and the invasiveness and the pervasiveness of, these, of the use of these technologies on humanity currently. And there is a lot of literature on it. And I think, as you pointed out, what really needs to happen is we need to do a lot more podcasts because many of us are actually engaged in this research. Many of us are reading the books. We are looking at the chronology you know, the, the whole history of mind control experimentation in this country. We do have information that we could share. And who are we, who do we need to share it with? We need to share it with psychologists and psychiatrists who are wrongfully diagnosing people who are being hit with V2K and other uh, neurotechnologies as delusional and schizoid. We need to share it with medical doctors in emergency rooms who are faced with situations like this and who again do the wrong thing and call the psychiatrist instead of understanding that this is a military experiment. In other words, they, they are victimizing the victim. Over and over again, you see the medical profession victimizing the victim, you know, forcing the victim to take antipsychotic medication, naming the victim schizoid and delusional, when the victim is actually a reporting victim of modern day human experimentation of an extremely invasive nature by the military and intelligence agencies and should be taken seriously. And so I think we've started that. In a sense, we've all embarked on it together. We're doing podcasts. I think we need to do a lot more podcasts, as you say, keep on talking about this tech, talk about you know this hive minding. A lot of people don't know what hive minding really is. The, in the interview, you spell it out really, really well. So again, you know, the interview is gonna come up very soon and people can see that. But I want to continue writing articles about this. I want to continue podcasting about this. And, you know, hopefully we can work together with other people who come forward. I invite every single V2K true targeted victim, reporting victim, to, to contact me, to do a podcast with me, to put your story out there. Because that's what we need to do. We need to record and document these stories and show the commonalities, you know, across the board. And then the other side of it is um, the rest of humanity, educated humanity. You know, we come. I think the three of us and many others who are targeted from an educated middle class. We've had the privilege of a wonderful education. 
you know, we've learned to read and write for heaven's sake in a world where people are still being kept down around the world. You know, I come from a country where literacy is a big deal in itself. So we are from an educated middle class and yet our own sisters and brothers, our own cousins, our own aunts and uncles, our fathers and mothers who are educated, who gave us our brilliant education, cannot believe this, cannot understand that this is military technology, cannot understand that there is a huge conspiracy afoot to keep this technology secret. You know, and that conspiracy involves media, mainstream media, which is totally in the lap of the guys who are running these programs. That uh, conspiracy involves law enforcement and that conspiracy involves uh, psychology and psychiatry. So those three in particular, it seems to me, are very important to reach. Law enforcement, media, or at least expose, because uh, it's very hard to imagine reaching them to make them change their ways at this point in time. We just need to expose them at this point in time, you know, expose yeah. the infamy of what they are doing. Law enforcement, media, and psychology slash psychiatry. Well, right now I have started, and I probably won't be able to finish it for a while. I'm trying to write what I hope will be a, a law enforcement primer on what is going on. Wonderful. Telling them to look for patterns. Don't look at, is this person doing the same thing over and over again, like the typical stalker laws require you to look at. I I just lost I got, Karen. I, you... Yeah, I, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. I got a. I I'm having to use my iPhone, and people keep calling me during this time period when I ask <laughs> them not to, so it knocks me off the uh, the broadcast. But um, I'm emphasizing to look for patterns. Look for patterns of behavior. You know, if a if a targeted individual goes to the drugstore and three cars pull up and they sit around the drugstore, you know, one on each side that it can get to. And those people wait that the target individual goes inside the drugstore, comes back out, leaves, and those three cars leave without anybody ever having gotten out of the car and gone into the drugstore. Well, guess what they were doing? They had directed energy weapons in their engines, and they were basically shooting into the drugstore, which not only affected the targeted individual, but it might have stopped the pacemaker of somebody inside. So that's a pattern, and it's not going to be the same three three people all the time, and the police still can't wrap their minds around that. So like I said, I I don't know when I'm going to be finished with it, but that's some, that's a project I decided to try to do to mm -hmm. explain these to pl explain this to law enforcement, those who might actually want to learn. Mm -hmm. And not only that, also sort of to record, I think, for posterity, the, the connections, so that law enforcement cannot turn around and say, oh, we never knew, which is what they're saying now to many people who are reporting these crimes, you know, especially with directed energy weapons. And, you know, the, the directed energy weapon scenario versus the neuro weapon, which, you know, mainly targets the brain, um, I think also needs to be mentioned in this context, because um, in terms of mind control, because just as subliminal voices now can be um, pumped into people's heads and subliminal messages via all sorts of different neurotech means. In addition, people's brain waves can be influenced by um, externally directed neuro, um, directed energy. So, in other because there are specific frequencies for different emotions, for anger and for irritation and happiness and joy and sadness and so on and so forth. So. In other words, humans can be manipulated in a myriad of ways currently. You see, and in fact, they are being manipulated in a myriad of ways. And those of us who've been targeted and who, have, who are being deliberately exposed on a constant daily basis to this weaponry know that it's already going on. And this, in a sense, could also be what's um, affecting interpersonal relationships and communication, Karen, as you were mentioning earlier, because there's also this aspect of uh, being worked on with these neural frequencies. Well, um, and one thing I'd like to mention, you know, um, kind of piggybacking off of what Karen was saying and what you just said is, you know, they are, people need to understand that these aren't weapons that you just grab off the shelf that anybody can use. And then pretty soon, if that happens, you know, everyone's going to know about them. These are weapons that require a certain a layer, you know, many layers of kind of protocols um, that, that, 
that gang stalkers and, and researchers, these voice to scholars, all abide by. And we talk about this a little bit in the interview, but you know, uh, the law enforcement community, you know, they need to understand that um, what good is a is a is a covert weapon if everybody knows about it. So you know, it is imperative for uh, you know uh, for a, a trainer, you know, for an instructor in who 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 uh, grants access to these weapons to instill in the minds of the users that the most important thing is to never get caught. And to, so in the Voice to Scholars case, you know, they don't mention their names, any, uh, you know, uh, personal uh, information, um, what their favorite food is, what the weather's like today, you know, anything that could be used to triangulate them, you know, what they look like, you know, nationalities. I mean, we're talking about, you know, uh, tens of thousands of co hours of conversation, but they don't mention, you know, things like that that are part of everyday normal conversation in, 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 in the outside world. So these protective protocols, you know, they're, they're not going to walk up on, you know, and knock, knock on your door as a psychiatrist and explain, you know, that, uh, you know, hi, uh, you know, I just wanted to let you know what's going on with the voice to skull program out there. Um, you know, doctors need to, to figure it out for themselves. You know, they're, they've signed, they're either facing, um, you know, years in prison uh, for, uh, for violating their gag order or, uh, you know, um, Aaron, you would be able to explain what, you know, what people on the inside are facing if they go public with something like this, um, but, or just a non-disclosure uh, agreement. But, uh, you know, people are not going to just reveal this stuff. There are many layers to the psychology to skull and of gang stalking that, um, you know, have to be explained kind of one by one, you know, one by ones, because people just can't grasp the fact that, uh, you know, this isn't just um, something that the press would get a hold of immediately in one interview and go public with. No, 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 no. Um, you know, uh, they need, uh, you know, evidence. They need paperwork for, uh, for, a, a, for a journalist to go public with. You know, that's what The Intercept or a Glenn, Glenn Greenwald would want, right? That he'd want paperwork, you know. Or, the, or a device. Or a device. Or yeah. device. But those devices do exist and have actually been exposed. I think there's been some exposure and disclosure. I think there's a determined attitude by people like Glenn Greenwald and The Intercept to not touch this issue and to not make it public. Well, let's, let's talk about the difference between classification, uh, the real classification and the people who are trying to tell you, Ramola, that you're leaking classified information by talking about it. If you are in on a project and you are in the intelligence community, you get read on to different projects. Let's say uh, you're going to a new office at the CIA or NSA, and it has a different classification than what you came from. Now, you may be top secret cleared, but you may not be top secret, and I'm going to make this up, you may not be top secret kumquat. Okay, so you're going to an office that is top secret kumquat. So you get read onto the project, you're told what it is, and you sign a non-disclosure form. So you are not able to talk about top secret kumquat, that it exists or that you work on it, or certainly not what it is. Now, if you go to the papers and tell them about top secret kumquat, you can be put in prison. Okay. Now, Ramola, were you ever read on to any project that said we're going to take over your life and torture you? Certainly not. No, and <laughs> no connection and you, with the IC. And you were never um, given a choice? Not at no. all. No, no offices, and no read-ins, no NDAs. You were never given a clearance. No clearance. <laughs> no clearance. But they're just doing this to you. So what they have done is taken this project and put it in the public forum, and they have put it onto a non-cleared person. Therefore, they have lost the clearance on it. It is now in the public forum, and for you to speak about it is not illegal. Brilliant. I love that you are spelling that out, because that... Yeah needs to be spelled out, I think, for the entire population of America, particularly the entire population of the intelligence community. Yes. So and why I, can I, 
Go ahead. Karen, why, why can somebody like yourself or Robert Duncan speak openly about these projects, but a newspaper, uh, you know, uh, refuses to interview him? What, what, why can a whistleblower be so out in the open, but yet re receive no attention from a newspaper? What, 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 what are your uh, well, thoughts I, on that? Well, I will tell you, in 2009, when NSA was gearing up to fire me, you know, for illegal and retaliatory purposes, I was still, go I mean, I half didn't believe them, but I was still giving them credit that maybe there was somebody who had said something that they believed, instead of being the, instead of the predication of fire me being totally made up like it was. But I said, okay, let's say there's somebody who actually believes some lie was told about me. Okay. So one of the things that was mentioned to me was, oh, there was a uh, leaked story in August of 2005 about NSA computer problems. And I said, well, I never worked NSA computer problems. So that's ludicrous. They would, uh, one of the people that who'd stolen, who had stolen my work to promote somebody else uh, had accused me of being the person that leaked the story about computer problems. And uh, it was a bald face lie. I never worked in computers. I don't have a computer science uh, degree. So I still kind of went with it. Okay, maybe somebody still believes that. So in 2009, I was researching any or all uh, NSA stories in the paper that might have been this because I never, I, the person who accused me initially showed it to me in the paper and I had no idea what she was talking about. So I left. And so then I went back and tried to find this article when I, was uh, trying to defend myself and uh, I couldn't really find it. So I got in touch with Siobhan Gorman who had been working for the Baltimore sun at that point in time, she was working for the wall street journal in Washington, DC. I explained my situation to her and I said, I'm trying to find this article because I would like to see it. I only saw the first paragraph or two of it, but I would like to read the entire article to see if there's any anything that I need to clear up you know because I thought it, it this is stupid I don't have the background I never worked computer science I never had access to this type of thing but I still wanted to find the article and she wrote me back a an email she and she said this is very interesting because um, I know journalists and other people who have reported this type of basically stalking behavior by NSA security so NSA security, even as early as 2009, had made it, made it known. And she explained, she said, if anybody writes something they don't like, or if they won't write something that they want them to write, then they get stalked and harassed. So this is well known in the journalism community that NSA will ruthlessly stalk and harass you if they don't like what you have written. Very so I interesting. Think yeah, this is well known in, in the journalist community, and we just don't know that they know it, you know, I mean, most of us. Yes, and I also think, Karen, at this point in time, I think they do know. I think everybody does indeed know. I think there is a reason for their silence, and I would suspect that that reason is associated with who is paying their bills. And fear. True, you know, True. and fear connected with the CIA. Yes, you see, and right. this is the thing that I'm all about. You know, the CIA, the Mossad. Um, what are the other big names of the big intelligence agencies? Like MI5, MI6, the BND. Yeah, the, the Germans, um, and, the NDB, and so on and so forth. Yeah, the I Canadians think right and the Australians are doing the same. They're doing they're the doing same the as well. Yes. Yeah, so all of these intelligence agencies, they've gained a name for themselves over the years, particularly, I think, the CIA and the Mossad. At least those mm -hmm. two most immediately come to my mind as two of the most brutal, you know, who are <laughs> most known for their incredibly ghastly, torturous uh, exploits all around the world in Latin America and the Middle East, all over the world and so on and so forth. So I think right up to this point in time that they have gotten this name of being these frightful, terrorizing agencies and people are deadly afraid. They do strike notes of fear, chords of fear in people's hearts. You know, so literally we, who are being the most tormented by them, the most persecuted by them, the most assaulted, we've come to a point, I think, of understanding where we are laughing at them. We are laughing at what they are doing because we know what they are doing. And we've come to the point of being absolutely irreverent about them. In other words, 
I personally have no fear of them. I see exactly what they have done. I see what a fearful, terrorizing organization they are. I'm not denying that. But because they're assaulting us, I feel it's much more important to me to, to simply report that this is what they are doing. You know, much more important merely to shine, uh, to just show up the mirror of what they are doing. So that's my focus. And so I think we are sort of in a different state. Once you start speaking out about this, there's no end to it. We're not going to stop speaking out, you know, just because we're yeah. getting a little bit of COINTELPRO on the streets and lunacy with red shirts and red flags and red cars and whatnot and so on and so forth. And, you know, and, and, and of course, there's, this is, this is the, the danger of the point in history that we are living in. Soon there will come a point when there will be no resistors like us. Why? Because mind control is galloping onward by leaps and bounds. It's taking over the people around us. It's already shutting down the people around us so that the people around us listen to our stories and listen to our accounts of reality. We're waving around meters, for heaven's sake. You know, we are showing RFID detectors. We're showing chips in our body. We're showing the incredible microwaves coming into our rooms. A minute ago, I was being blasted. I don't know if you saw me. I was literally sitting and sweating. So they're doing this all the time. They're literally hitting me nonstop all the time. They're literally, at this moment, hitting, trying to hit me in my heart. And this is nonstop. They seem to love my heart. They want to hit my heart. They're really interested in yeah. my heart. This is well, not. They want to stop you because you're the premier historian as far as this goes, you know. You're the, you're, you're the most danger to them because of the area like coverage of this topic, for sure. And I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure they want to stop you, you know, because you're doing so very much good. Thank you. And I will say, too, that yeah, it's wonderful when people speak out. And people have thanked me and been just profusely uh, complimentary. But I try to remind them I could be a voice in the wilderness crying out with no one listening if people didn't have the courage, and I mean immense courage, to give interviews, to write articles. So you can have a million whistleblowers, and if nobody has the courage to cover what they're saying, it won't do any good. So I personally thank you and the other people who have interviewed me and written articles about what I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely. You're very welcome, Karen. And frankly, we need to thank you as well, because you are the most, the preeminent whistleblower in this arena. Yeah. You know, as Chris pointed out earlier, um, you are from the inside. You are an insider. You're from the NSA. You're an intelligence analyst from the NSA. Um, and therefore, your voice carries weight. And I do know that lately, I think you've also been experiencing a lot of attacks De de deliberately pointed at you and slanted at you for that very reason, because you too are in a very prominent position, being from the NSA, being a voice from the NSA, speaking out. Well, I, you know, I tend to make fun of them too. I mean, I keep repeating the fact that these people offer you a choice of the stick or the stick. And exactly. What am I, what am I going to do? Oh, come exactly. on. You know, so I... No, and they're that's just, precisely they're, it. They're, they're morons, they're baboons with high tech is what they are. And we're in the same boat as far as that is concerned. You know, it's like um, they want to shut us up. And yes, it's, it's, um, I'm aware, you know, with the nonstop heart hits, I'm aware that somebody wants to finish me off quietly with a, with a directed energy weapon remotely from a distance. So there's a lot of plausible deniability. And they can say, oh, you know, there's um, heart trouble runs in her family. And uh, <laughs> she got knocked off. At the age of 53, what can we say, you know? So I'm sure all of that is going on. However, I have a determination to record all of this, you know? And this is where I'm coming from. I'm very interested in simply recording the reality and the truth of what's going on. So that, that continues. And so as the, the point that I was trying, trying to make earlier is I suppose I understand that I'm on the inside in a certain way because I'm also being hit. I've been targeted. I've been researching this for four years now. I've been trying to find out what on earth is going on in this country and why I'm being hit and what it's all about. And I think I've just been publishing everything that, that I've been finding and I've been working with others. And now together, I think we are at a point of great disclosure at this moment in time. But my question really is, who is watching us? Who's watching these shows? Who's reading our articles? Who's getting informed? 
You know, who are the educated people out there who are getting informed? Are you really getting informed? Are you getting informed and just uh, sitting down and doing nothing about it? I'm here to tell you, wake up. Because what's hitting us and what's hitting Chris, you know, with the V2K program, which is 10 times worse than the due program, which I'm being hit with, you know, is, um, is actually uh, seems to be something because it is being kept secret, has the potential to continuously move forward, be developed further, and hit larger and larger numbers of people. And you know who it's going to hit are your children. It's going to hit your children and your grandchildren. And I say that to everybody, not just um, you know civilians, but also people in the military and people in the intelligence community. Your children's lives, I mean, consider it over. Consider their lives over. They're never going to be individuals. They are never going to be free people if we do not talk about this, if we do not publish wholesale about this. Oh, and by the way, we should also address the people in the media, people in mainstream media who are being paid those fat paycheck, paychecks by Rupert Murdoch and all those other you know, wealthy people who own the, uh, the six major news outlets of the world, etc., cetera, and, um, and who are you know, working hand in glove with the CIA, who are completely part of Bird spell, who are part of that Agenda 21 globalist spell, and who are also part of this totalitarian fascist imbroglio that's currently underway, you know, who possibly have been promised uh, places in underground bases if an asteroid should hit the planet, or if the next superstorm, manufactured superstorm, should take out the East Coast, or whatever. They, there, is no, there is most definitely a kind of totalitarian conspiracy underway, and I think many of us have explored it. Uh, many experts have explored it. I won't go into it over here, but it exists, and it's, it's what is running multiple uh, repression programs on humanity currently. And the end result is going to be absolute robotization, absolute brave new world. Your children, are, your children the the... the, the, the your perspective for your children really are robots who are androgynous, who do what they're told, who are broken up into categories, who are work slaves, mm -hmm. who will not question their masters, who will not resist, who will not protest, who will not speak out, who will do everything to be compliant and who will keep each other in line thanks to mind control. Because mind control is going to be the new FBI infiltrator of the 1970s. We don't need those FBI infiltrators anymore within our groups because that's what they're working at, making mind control um, the function that they're trying to make it fulfill. You know, So we become our own intel agents. We become our own overseers and supervisors and, and suppressors. So that's the world that we are heading toward, which is why people in the media may want to wake up and start breaking free and start reporting the truth, you know? And just take one tiny leaf from my book. I'm currently not being paid. I'm a total journalist working in the wilderness with no money coming my way. I would love to say I'm self-sufficient. I am not self-sufficient. I rely on a few donations here and there from people. I need to set up properly on Patreon or some other place. I need to sort of announce myself as a journalist and ask people to support me um, because I'm intent on doing this work, you know? But here I am, I'm trying very hard, I'm doing my best, I'm trying my best. I'm not being paid. These guys have fabulous salaries. Glenn Greenwald has a fabulous salary. He's living in Brazil. Okay, he's just one person. Of course, we are picking on him because you know we all like to pick on Glenn Greenwald uh, for many reasons. But there's other people, right? <laughs> there's other journalists. They also have fabulous jobs. They're probably living in the Caribbean. And they're propagandists, they're not journalists anymore. And they are all know. propagandists. Yeah. The, there, it's blood money. You know, and so that, that's what we need to sort of throw an invitation out to them for the sake of your children and our children. Please leave those, you know, f killing fields that you are engaged in of suppressing well, and destroying humanity and step out of it and start becoming a bit independent and a bit truthful. And I would point back to, to um, Chris and say that if your children or grandchildren are especially talented, they might be especially targeted. You know, and right? That is what is going on right now. The talented are being targeted. Well, you know, uh, Karen, uh, that, it, it's so important that you mention that because, you know, it, it reminds me there was a, a great book, uh, Karen Armstrong uh, uh, is going to write about. Um, 
um, myth and religion. And uh, she wrote a book called Fields of Blood, and she refers to the warrior class. And, you know, in America now, there really is this warrior class, and it always has existed throughout time. They're usually right under, you know, the, the, the heads of, of, of government, you know, right under kind of the legislative branch, you know, the rep, the, you know, they're, they're, and, and in America, you are not safe unless you are, and even if you're in this warrior class, you're not safe, but this is a group, this is the group that's running things. Um, I have my, my mother's brother uh, is a MIT educated uh, naval engineer, uh, aerospace engineer, who put up, it was the launch commander of the Millstar, Millstar satellite array. You know, he was a guy who launched the Millstar satellites and Global Star as well, um, which is a satellite telephone company. And, you know, I thought having people like this in my family, you know, uh, you know I, I'd never dreamed something like the Voice to Skull even existed, but that something like that would protect me. Um, it didn't. It didn't. Um, you know, in this article, and Ramola and I have talked about it, my business partner and my IT consulting company and first cousin um, uh, married uh, the daughter of Palestine's lawyer advisor, uh, Vera Gallen Debus. She wrote the advisory opinion for the International Court of Justice uh, regarding the, the legality of the separation wall in Palestine. She authored that. A very well known international lawyer and law school professor. Um, I thought having someone like that in my family, you know, protected me. When I went public about this again in 2014, I contacted Vera directly. She came down with cancer and died eight months later. And I don't know if that's connected, but, you know, I've tried to tell my uncle about this. He won't listen to me because he doesn't believe me or he's scared. And here's a person uh, who, whose son works for the Aerospace Corporation, software developer, who I was told won a Black Ops, you know, Nobel Prize sort of award for architecting this database that tracks all of our military satellites. You know, these two people are in my family and they won't give me the time of day. And I think it's because they're scared. I think they're just like, Chris is on his own. He's on his own in this. And so, you know, we... We are, we're all kind of faced with that, but the public, you know, you, you understand how things like uh, the Holocaust happened in Germany without anybody knowing about it. You know, what was it? They, did they know about it and they were just afraid that it could happen to them? Or they just couldn't believe anything like that could ever happen? It's, it's one or both of those things mixed together, but that's exactly the situation that we're in. I mean... And, and, and with this pool of TIs that has, been, that, that, have, that have been created, that has been created, I mean, you know, I don't see any end to it. I don't see any end to it um, without people publishing peer-reviewed articles, uh, people publishing articles that can serve as the backbone for more articles being published. I mean, there's one psychiatrist in, um, uh, who was from uh, uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland who wrote about these directed energy weapons uh, in a, a peer reviewed, you know, uh, in a journal article, but it was for the Pakistan Medical Journal. And he is in the PsychNet net database for the APA, which is just a whole nother, you know, can of worms. But um, he, he has four other articles that are in the APA database, but not the one that refers to directed energy weapons. So, you know, we know about the APA's relationship with the military. The, the psychologists, uh, the military is the largest employer of psychologists in the country as an institution. So, you know, who can we count on to get these stories out? You know, when does a sexual harassment story become newsworthy? You know, after five people come forward, 10 people come forward with the same story? You know, it, it, with this whole thing uh, that came out recently, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, with Harvey, Harvey uh, Wiseman, uh, what's his name Weinstein. again? Weinstein. Weinstein. He, um, you know, how many news agencies were aware of this? It's almost like everybody has to be aware of it before, you know, uh, before, you know, you know, one person can go forward or before, you know, the, the walls start crumbling in. It, it's, it's almost that that's what our job is now to make sure everybody knows that this is happening. Um, and then the most 
courageous of those journalists will step forward and actually write something about it and take a chance. Um, but that's the situation we're in. And, and, and I, I, I wish I had some answers, you know, I, I wish I, I did, but I don't. It's yes, just I think, well, I think the answer, Chris, is simply to do what we are doing. You know, and to continue to speak out and continue to ask people to join us because we do need others to join us. We need other journalists to join in this, you know, whole program of um, exposure and discovery that we are engaged in the Barkton. And um, we need people to do some serious thinking and serious support and serious writing. People from, you know, the academic world as well, as you point out. People from my, my uncle's name is John Koji and his son's name is John Koji. So just if anybody's watching, uh, you know, those are the individuals. And I hate to use their names, but it's in the article that we're publishing. Um, so it's important to get it out. But, um, you know, it's frightening having people in your family and, and you don't know why they're ignoring you or if they're actually, um, you know, the voice to scholars try to make you think they're involved. They do that to all of us, you know, our friends and family. Um, there's all sorts of reasons. One, you know, the fear is one big aspect of it because, as I say, there's this whole mythology around these uh, intelligence agencies as being super powerful and super great and whatever, you know, and terrifying and all that stuff. And therefore, one the proper response to the CIA is fear, and you uh, simply do as you're told, even if it involves assaulting your neighbor for it. And that's where I would personally draw the line, and where Karen would personally draw the line, and where Chris would draw the line, and the rest of us. You know, all of us would draw the line there. When we are asked to harm somebody else just for the sake of the intelligence agencies or for national security. We would draw the line. And I think more and more people in America need to wake up and start drawing that line. You know, start drawing lines because when you are asked to assault somebody, when you are told lies about somebody, that's where you draw the line. Don't become like my neighbors who are living in fear. You know, and I think the, the, the point that I wanted to make now that I just remembered, Chris, was. Um, my neighbors across the street, they've got a little green light burning. I may have mentioned this just uh, to uh, on a previous uh, podcast or previous Techno Forum podcast. They've got a little green light burning. I've always wondered what that green light is. And I think it's connected to Agenda 21 because it's supposed to be a green agenda, right? But it's actually a green global dictatorship agenda. So that's what they're, they're closing their eyes and their mind to. If they have not done their reading, if they've not figured out what Agenda 21 is, they need to wake up. Because what Agenda 21 is mass robotization, is brave new world for their own children. And they have three kids, you know, and they have uh, acquiesced to putting a green light on their porch, to presenting that image of Agenda 21 to the world because they think it's the next form of government. You see, it's uh, the U.S. is dissolving, nation states are dissolving, the U.N. is taking over, global governance is on its way, we're, going to, we're heading toward a one-world government, and therefore we are on the right side of history. So I think there's a bit of that going on as well, not just fear. You know, there's this thing of aligning on the right side of history and aligning with the right people, etc., which is so wrong. And you and I can see it is yeah. so wrong. And if we get in early enough, we'll be part of the chosen who get to live. Yes, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> that's it. They do think they are the chosen. And the right thing to do is to do what they are being asked to do, which is to join together, just like the Stasi, and scapegoat one person in the community and throw rotten eggs at her. You know, and that's well, what really they do. And, and, you know, we all know about, um, you know, bureaucracy and, you know, we have enough of it in America. Why would anyone believe in a, in a new world order and the bureaucracy involved in that, and the car, car, um, compartmentalization of these programs? If, if every program is not in, the, you know, in view, in plain sight, so people can respond to it, then there's no democratic process taking place. Every single program needs to be transparent. So the feedback from the public can have a say in, what that, in, in, in the legitimacy of that program and what it's doing. So it's what, what people, if people believe that, they're out of their minds because they're, they're supporting more bureaucracy and more, you know, uh, you know minutia, but more, excuse me, more, more um, um, you know, uh, just uh, the, uh, the uh, um, let's just say uh, uh, hidden programs, um, uh, the more ability to uh, siphon off and, and for your own interests. Um, money, uh, uh, you know, in order to, 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 to progress, you know, uh, hidden agendas. I guess that's the word I'm, I was trying to look for. Um, but, you know, look at me. 
you know, it's, it's hard for me to even speak, you know, and I'm, I'm out there, you know, trying to, to put this stuff, you know, into the public view in, uh, into the, you know, public discourse. But, um, you know, there are only a few of us that are even, you know, as far as I'm aware of, uh, even alive who are in this, uh, this Manchurian candidate project project. Um, uh, I haven't really spoken to anyone who's been through what I have. I've met people who've been, you know, biorobotized uh, to certain degrees, but not taken over completely. Where are they? You know, um, uh, you, you, you folks have done so many. I mean, you're so amazing. I, I just love both of you to death. And you've done so much to get the information out there. But where are the other TIs? Where are the other Manchurian candidates? You know, I'm being told all day long that I'm going to be killed. Um, for speaking out. The last time we, we did our last two podcasts from Ola, they tortured me for 48 hours straight after that. So, oh you know, that's life for me. But, it's, but people need to understand that, that, you know, we're voices that are here now, but we're not always going to be around, you know? And, and it's, just so, it's just very frustrating because, you know, um, I was just like everybody else. I was, uh, you know, eloquent, and uh, I was in sales my whole life, you know? And, uh, you know, college grad, went through the, you know, did the fraternity thing and, you know, social life and all of that stuff, had plenty of friends. And now I can barely find words. And then I read books like uh, with the one I mentioned in this interview, you know, which the Shane O'Mara wrote, uh, The Neuroscience of Interrogation. It proves that psychological um, uh, uh, torture degrades your memory. It destroys your memory. So on top of all of these waves that they're hitting us with and the brain to computer interface, they, just the, the fact they're torturing us makes it impossible to recall anything, you know, stories. And, and like I said, I have no working memory. If, when I read, I can't remember the, the sentence before the one I'm, I'm on, you know. Um, this is what it's done to people like me long term. And we're the ones that have to communicate it. And gosh, it's so frustrating, you know. But uh, today they let me sleep. So I'm actually in a in a much better cognitive kind of state today than I have been, you know, but this is it. This is the best it gets, you know, so. But you've done a magnificent job, Chris, on all our podcasts, in the interview, the print interview, which, you know, I'm so eager for everybody to read, which I'll release very soon. And also today, I think today's conversation has been kind of blockbuster uh, for many reasons. I think we've traveled all over the, the landscape here of, um, you know, domestic terrorism from the DHS to uh, terror and torture and secret CIA um, neuro torture thanks to the CIA and DIA and DARPA. And, um, you know, talking also about the situation on the ground here in our neighborhoods and communities and the difference between, between, uh, difference between what it means to be American versus what the U.S. government is doing to the American people. You know, what the so-called agencies of the U.S. government who should be working for the American people, they're not working for the American people. They're working against the American people. And it's time the American people sort of snapped out of it and woke up. It is. Because they, they don't even understand anymore what it is to be American. I mean, the, the vast majority of people have been so dumbed down in their lack of education. I mean, they've been educated, but not in anything that matters you know so they have no idea what an american is they have no idea what our quote unquote inheritance is they do not know what the country was founded upon and they are thinking that doing anything the government tells them makes them patriots that is fascism that is statism and basically america told god to get lost and now what do we see? We see people worshiping the government, thinking that the government can do no wrong and the government um, is all knowing. And that, you know, there's nothing the government can do that is, is illegal because it's the government. Well, how stupid can you be? This is just abysmally ignorant. And you are not an American for doing what a subverted neo-totalitarian government is telling you to do. Go out and kill your neighbor because it's good for everybody. 
Oh, well, that's not good enough for you. Okay, go out and kill your neighbor and we'll give you money. Okay, on board. All right, you're not an American. And I have told Romola and other people who have come here because of American principles that they admire and that they believe in their hearts that they are more American than any of these people. These people need to be exercised from the United States, stripped of their citizenship at minimum. I would like to see the vast majority of them imprisoned, but we need to teach what happens when you take on foreign ideas that are wholly and totally incompatible with the American principles. And if you do that, that shows that you don't understand the American principles. So we need to go back and re-educate people as to the fact this country was founded upon the principles of protecting the individual. Because if any and all individuals are protected, then all Americans are protected. But if we have mob rule, where 10 people can decide to kill the, the 11th person because they will benefit from it, that is not only not a constitutional republic or democracy, which is kind of a loose representation of that, but it is mob rule. It's not a government. It's not civilization. It's not American. And people need to realize that they're selling out their country and, as you put it, their children. And is that big screen TV uh, was that good enough to sell out maybe your third grandchild? Really? So people need to find their humanity. And, you know, make America American again. I like that. Yes, exactly. Oh, the Constitution, right, it's to protect citizens uh, from the government, you know? Yes. And people don't understand that something that's fundamental is that, you know, um, it's, it's um, you know, there's so much to talk about and, and we can do so many podcasts, but, you know, you know, understanding the individual stories is so important and just communicating them within your friendship circle and your family. You know, this is what is being reported. This is what's being done to people. You know, all you have to do is think about how important these weapons are and to think that, you know, Neuro weapons and psychotronic weapons, you know, uh, are, are nuclear weapons that don't leave a trace. They're stealth, no mark weapons. You would, the, 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 the most important people, the people that you would sit back and think these are the, the best and brightest in the country, and they're the, they're the ones who are going to make the best decisions for mankind uh, because that's what America has, you know, that's what the military has at the very highest levels. You know, these are the people who know about these weapons, and these are the decisions they made to use them against hundreds, if not thousands of people in experimentation programs, you know, uh, to create this TI pool that uh, anyone can be thrown into at any time. You know, this is what the best and brightest, you know, West Point, you name it, Naval Academy, wherever else, um, you know, these people come from or recruited out of. You know, this is what they created for us. This is what we're stuck with and have to dismantle. We're just trying to get the word out about this program, let alone dismantle it. You know, so uh, it's a real letdown. It's a real letdown for people like me who, who you know, always, you know, thought of themselves as patriots and had, you know, the families that go back to the Revolutionary War and have, you know, um, all of the things that, 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 that people think about when they, when they call themselves Americans. You know, um, all those things that, that, that make you love this country and, 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 you know, they're all out the window. I'm with, I'm with Karen. The flag, it doesn't mean anything to me because of what these individuals who were placed in these positions are doing. You know, I love Americans, but I do not love the government. You, and, and this is all you need to know, you know, nonstop torture until you kill yourselves. No documentation of any kind this adhesion to the protocol that protects their anonymity, protects their anonymity, which we all know makes people more violent in the first place. But, you know, these are not programs that are designed to be revealed anytime soon. You know, most of these programs have in the past, these non-consensual testing programs haven't been revealed. Um, you know, if it were not for the, the, the work and of, of 
people breaking into offices and finding files, you know, MKUltra would never have been heard about. So, so this isn't a government that's doing this to win a, a short-term arms race uh, and then plans to reveal this, you know. They are protecting their identities. They are hiding information. They're putting out false information into the public, like, you know, in response to these Cuba attacks, that they don't know what it is. You know, uh, there's nothing that can explain it. Defies the laws of physics, you know? I mean... But, but we as TIs are supposed to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt before we're believed. But the government can't find evidence of it. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, the poor government. You see, the CIA is so clueless about its own weaponry. Um, you know, those are lies, as we know. The CIA, apparently, one of their mottos is, you know, how to tell a lie. Uh, who, be who gets better at telling a lie year after year, I suppose, gets promotions and so forth. Um, uh, what it points to, really, Chris, is, is secrecy. The idiocy of secrecy, the wrongfulness of secrecy. As long as secrecy is held up as some kind of national trait, you know, as some kind of need in the government, then what's going to happen is more and more projects are going to be swept under the rug. And this kind of terrible tro torture, terrible human rights violation that's going on is going to be kept under the rug. And this is part of the problem. And this is part of why journalists can come along and say, I can't report on anything unless I have a document. So, yeah, sit around waiting for some with CIA whistleblower to give you a document. And, of course, they're not going to do it, right? Because they yeah. value their lives too much. So, right. well, and I, you know, we, I was going to say, I'm able to talk about it because I'm not bringing out any documents. And NSA denies it. So I'm not revealing any secrets that they admit exist. No, you're not revealing secrets at all. And you're not, you, I, I haven't seen a single document from you. So as far as they're concerned, you know, you're totally in the clear. And they should really not yes. be targeting you at all, um, as they shouldn't be targeting any of us. Well, that's my point, too, is that, you know, yes, you can say, uh, basically, you know, if they, oh, isn't it terrible that they target somebody who worked for the intelligence community? Well, that may be a good story to tell people and say, okay, you think that you're in the FBI, you think that you're in the CIA or NSA, and so you're part of the family, so we're going to protect you. Well, no, that shouldn't even exist, okay? They will target anybody, everybody, okay? Um, and, I, and nobody should expect to be special, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, nobody, people, like I said, they shouldn't say because I'm a governor's daughter, I'm a, a, a senator's wife, I'm protected. You're not, you know, and I don't think anybody should be on the, oh, you can't touch them list for anything. So if people think they are. Yeah, but in a sense also. And also, actually, that phenomenon, because nobody is protected, also makes people think, oh, you know, these terrible weapons, because I think at this point, everybody knows these weapons exist, the electromagnetic weapons, because, you know, the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate is now an open, uh, known fact, you know, they've got websites, they've got uh, conferences, they have directed energy conferences around the world year after year after year. So the f um, the is being kept secret um, on humans, you know, and on Americans within America. So that's being kept secret, and which is why we get these strange stories, Chris, where the CIA and FBI come along and say, oh, sonic weapons, never heard of that. Um, you know, and it must be sonic weapons. Let's not mention microwave weapons. Let's not mention millimeter wave weapons or any other kind of weapon that could really give you a headache, you know, and so on. So all, all sorts of lies. It just proves, you know, how dark their, their, their interests really are, you know. How they are planning to keep these things as secretive, as, you know, uh, under, as, as protected as they possibly can for who knows what reasons. It can only be nefarious. I, you know, it could only be, you know, to target people in other countries and in this country that they don't believe uh, they, you know, who they don't want around, who are causing problems for them. And when you have such a large program like the gang stalking program and V2K program, you you're going to get your George Zimmermans who are looking at you, uh, you know, uh, putting things in your trash and, you know, becoming, you know, uber paranoid about, you know, what you're doing. What are you up to? Who are your business contacts? You know, I told the story about 
uh, the the gang stalker who my my landlord who put me into this who I believe is at least attached to this program somehow, um, you know, becoming uh, you know, it was filming me, you know, putting up spy cameras in his house where I was renting a room because he wanted to know no he wanted to know more about my business relationship with Good. my clients and you know he needed to know this information and you know it's none of none of your business you know who my friends are and how we got to know each other you know and that's what you know what what people you know i i think you know who are in this kind of security apparatus or trained in security you know they they're kind of naturally um, desire, you know, to know as much as they can about everybody. They think it's their business, you know, to know. And, and that's where these weapons are. That's a domain they fall into is these security specialists, you know. And so it's terrifying. It's terrifying. If everybody thinks, if anybody thinks they're not going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know brought into this somehow, they're, they're lying to themselves, you know. They're lying to themselves. Um, uh, so it, it, it and, and and there's so much to talk about. You have the transhumanism and and all of these things. You know what what's this religion almost that that people are subscribing to or you know abiding by? It's a cult. Uh, it's yes, a cult. like a death cult. It is. It is. And there is, as you say, so much to talk about, Chris, and we probably have to shelve it for another day because looking at the time and we probably have to bring this broadcast to an end. We've gone overboard by, you know, several minutes, so almost a whole hour. So at this point, oh. we, we should think uh -oh. of wrapping it up and letting all our captive listeners go home and have lunch probably or dinner <laughs> or whatever. So, um, you know, this is... Um, it's great to be able to speak openly about these subjects. As you say, there's so much to say. And, you know, once again, one can only appeal to journalists of conscience out there and journalists of integrity and psychiatrists of conscience and psychiatrists of integrity and, you know, medical professionals of conscience and integrity and um, intelligence community analysts and employees of conscience and integrity. You know, the time has come to take a match to secrecy is my opinion. The time has come to set secrecy aside in the interests of humanity. Because terrible things are going on, terrible weapons are being developed, and terrible weapons are being used on Americans and on world populations. So it's time for people in the intelligence agencies to sort of snap out of it, you know, break out of it, start new lives. I mean, well, I'm sorry, I would think that your lives and and covered on all sides by secrecy must be in some ways hugely impoverished anyway. So, you know, art, creative writing, science, come take a workshop with me. Get me out of this program. You know, I'd like to get back to writing my novels and running creative writing workshops for kids and for adults alike. I'd be happy to, yeah. to run workshops for everybody. So, <laughs> and Karen would be happy to go back to being an artist and uh, reading all her history books. <laughs> and uh, Chris would love to travel and, uh, you know, write, uh, write uh, novels, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Write. Had, He's such a great writer. I had an art gallery, had an art gallery in Denver um, for uh, kind of underground uh, unknown artists. Wow. And three, three of our artists have gone on to great careers. One won the Seattle Mural Project. And, you know, we were supported Wonderful. by the community. Um, a lot of folks in... Uh, in the activist community in Oakland, Ashara Ikendayu, and, and these folks are, are close friends of mine. So this grabs you no matter where you are, corporate America or, you know, within, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the art community or, or, or creative communities in your, in your cities. Uh, nobody, you know, this affects everybody. And, and you're treated the same way. You know, when you try to go public about this, even to activists, they raise their eyebrow because they don't know anything about the technology. And, and so, you know, it, it takes an army to get the word out. And piece yes. by piece, I think we can do it. Um, but, uh, but it's frustrating, you know, for victims. To, uh, we are trying to get out as much information as we can because we don't know if we're going to be around tomorrow. That's the way my mindset is kind of, you know, wh where it is these days. I don't know if I'm going to be around tomorrow. So I'm trying to get out as much as I can right now. Um, and that's the way we're all, you know, they make us feel that way. That's the purpose of the torture, you know? Um, so but yeah. I, thank you so much for inviting me on. It was wonderful to be able to speak with you. I, I, I 
I, I watch these podcasts all the time. Um, and, and Karen, thank you for everything you've, you've been doing. Um, and I hope you, you, you know, I know you will read, read the interview. Um, yes. You're, I've you're, read part of it. I, I've you? read part of the draft and I recommend very highly that everybody take a look at this. You, this is a must read. Absolutely. Yes, a must and read. it will be published shortly. It's not yet published. You know, I have to do all that work with graphics, as I said, but um, I'll have it out there maybe tonight or tomorrow sometime, hopefully. So. And thank you, Chris. Thank you oh. very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Karen. Thank you very much. Any last words, anybody? And by the way, you can, we can stay on for a few minutes after I switch off the broadcast, just to let you know. Okay, okay. Um, I would say to the intelligence community that you, most likely, like I, chose to work there because of certain talents, certain interests that you wanted somehow to protect your country and keep world peace, and that this is not it. To silence people and make them into uh, slaves, that's not why you joined. And while you may not be doing any of this, you may be reporting on, I don't know, the buildup of tanks on the you know, on the Russian border or the, uh, you know, Russian submarines on the East Coast, way too close to us. Maybe that's what you're reporting. But someone at NSA is helping to enslave the, your fellow Americans who you thought you were protecting. So this is something you have to figure out. How do you help those people that you were determined to help before and why is this different that maybe you think that you should stay silent and let it happen? You shouldn't. Because you took an oath, as well as I took an oath, to protect the people of the United States. And if we can get this stopped from harming us, then we can get it stopped from us harming the rest of the world. And that is not why the, a, the United States was created. It was not to harm the rest of the world. So we need whatever help you can render us without, without being arrested, <laughs> hopefully without, you know, but uh, you need to maybe go to your senator, congressman, or even Larry Clayman and say, I know of information that I need the, the House uh, Intel Committee to be told about, and uh, I need that to be declassified or I need some uh, legal protection so that the people who have classifications can look at this and see that wrong is being done under classification and there's a law against that. You cannot classify something merely to hide its criminal nature. So there are ways that the people in the intel community can help us and I would ask them to do so. That's wonderful and powerful. Thank you so much. Chris, any last yeah. words? I second that, please. Um, you know, there are people committing suicide. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I can't tell, I can't say anything that should be more important than that. Um, you've heard what happened to me. Uh, you know, I don't know where the rest of us are. I don't. Um, and, uh, and I know how they, how they push us to suicide. I, I deal with that on a daily basis. And so, um, you know, that's any program that's, a, that's designed to operate in this manner for a technology that, is, that, that could be innovated endlessly. I mean, these technologies can be innovated endlessly, which means the class of classification um, can, can go on um, endless, you know, to, uh, uh, for, 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 50 years, you know, 100 years with these weapons. So, which puts people like me in a no-win situation. And, and, and you have to think about this stuff logically. All of these tortures are always having to do with how your brain logically kind of comes to an answer. What, what do you think about? How do humans operate? They think logically. And, and when none of this is out in the open, when the president doesn't mention, you know, US officials don't mention, don't mention th these weapons, the existence of these weapons, you have no TIs who have ever been released from the program. No voice to skull victims have ever been released from the program. There's no information out there about someone saying, hey, I'm out. It's, it has completely stopped for me. Um, you know, uh, it, it leads you to, to deduce logically that 
There is no escape. This is torture until uh, you kill yourself. Um, and you know, there are, there's a Yale professor, I, I don't know if he's there anymore, um, Shelley Kagan, who did a whole lecture series on the rationality of suicide. And uh, one of the things he mentions is uh, when you are in a, in a no-win situation, when, uh, you know, when, when you know, there's a graph, you know, when your life is going like this and there's no chance of release, usually people have a bad period and then it always goes back down, but they can't, they don't see this in the future. They don't see this part. In, suicide, in, in torture, it's this. It's nonstop. You're at the worst period of your life constantly. And so the rationality is to, is to think about suicide. That's the suicide ideation. That's what pops into your mind, the suicide ideation. So that's where we are. That's why there aren't many people like me out there you know, talking because uh, you know, I know Myron May was a voice to skull victim and you could see it in his eyes. I wouldn't, he said, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. And that's what, that's what it is. So, you know, that's the seriousness we, we need to kind of give this and how we, I think some of us need to talk about this is it's life and death. There's no time to wait. There's no time to wait. Yes, thank you, Chris. That was very powerful. And I would just like to second that as well and just say that this is a life and death situation for many. And this is why people in the intelligence community definitely need to step up to the plate here and need to find their spines, need to find their conscience, need to find their humanity, you know, the soul of their humanity. And I would venture to say, uh, also in keeping with our conversation this morning, need to find the American in them, you know, the true American values in them. Happening to us right now with this of uh, suppression, surveillance, and totalitarianism is not American. We all agree on that. So on which note, you know, plenty to think about, and we'll come back and revisit these subjects, and Chris, hopefully, do more podcasts and continue talking about it. We all care very much about you, and I think I speak for many of us in saying that we want to save your life. We want to save the lives of every V2K victim out there. And that's part of what's motivating me and many others to do what we are doing. You know, we're here in the business of human rights protection, advocacy, and saving lives. You know, and we're also standing up, it seems like, the, the primordial Americans. We're standing up for this country, really. We are not the extremists or the adversaries to the government or whatever. We're really standing up for humanity in this country within these borders, you know, and for humanity around the world. So... In any case, much to say, I know. So we could go on, but we should probably close. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching. And do take this video, video link and pass it on to anybody that you know who could be of influence, you know, whether it's a journalist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or an academic, whoever, anybody you can think of, just send the link. Because another thing that's happening, at least to my podcast, is they're literally being buried online. I don't know who's watching them. You know, if it's only other TIs who are watching them or if other people are watching them. So um, help us. Just send the link out. That would help, I think. You yeah. know, help the cause. So thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Guess we'll switch off now. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Bye-bye.